Hello, David Zeritsky for the Bond Experience. Welcome back. Now, you may be a little tired, a little tuckered out from talking about no time to die. I don't see why. I don't see how. Because the reality is, is we have a lot to talk about still, and it's just the beginning. So here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to put a round table together. What is that? Well, I need people other than myself to create a round table. The first thing I thought about was, Imagine if I could get the absolute A-listers of YouTube. I mean, you know, Jeroen from Dutch Bond Fan and Calvin Dyson. Um, imagine if I could get Joe Darlington from Being James Bond. The reality is they said no to me, every single one of them. Happily, happily, I have um, very indecent pictures of each one of them, and they all had to say yes. So <laughs> welcome to the show, Calvin, Jeroen, and Joe Darlington. Welcome. Thank Hello. you. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you. Thank you. You said those pictures were for private use. I didn't realize <laughs> that you were going to ever uh, resort to blackmail. <laughs> it, blackmail all the way to get get the all of us together. I am so happy to see all of you. When I think of YouTube and the Bond community, this is the visual that I I see. So, guys, thank you for making the time. Thank oh, you. Thank you for organizing. I, I hope this doesn't mean you're not going to put those pictures out there. I, oh, never mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't know. Just for that, I'm editing one right now, and I've got the perfect one, Joe. Oh, God. <laughs> the time that you forgot the bathroom was locked. Listen, we're not here to talk about that. We are here to talk about No Time to Die. We haven't had a lot of prep together. Maybe some of us have seen your individual reviews. You've all had reviews, spoilers and otherwise. And by the way, for those watching, as we normally do, we will tell you right now, at this point, this being October 23rd when we're filming this, we are going to talk about spoilers. Sorry, Australia. Um, but let's set the table a little bit because I'd like to go around the room. Calvin, we're going to start with you. Um, first of all, tell everybody how many times you've seen the film. And I would like you to do something just to give us a view of where you're coming from with your opinion. If you could rate this film excellent, good, average, or poor. Okay, well, I've seen it four times so far. Uh, poss possibly going to aim for a fifth. I tend to see them all four times, but yeah, it's just four so far. And um, it's, it's really tough to sum up feelings <laughs> about this film with one word. I'm going to go with good. Oh. I feel like my feelings average out into that space so um that that's my word and um yeah maybe we'll get into details as we go on with the discussion absolutely we're gonna get it's all about the details otherwise this video would be two minutes and 57 seconds long no one likes that <laughs> uh joseph how many times have you seen it and and how what word would you gravitate to uh i am up to my third viewing i will probably time permitting get one or two more viewings in um i'm gonna go out there and i'm gonna say I would call this excellent. I would definitely call this an excellent film, um, particularly if if I just judge this on its own merits. Is this a, what I call this a quality film? And let's say I'm bringing somebody with me to, who never saw a Bond movie, and I'm trying to sort of, you know, get them excited about James Bond. I feel like this is the kind of film I can show somebody and not have to apologize for. There is there's no moment in the film like a lot of them do where it's just kind of like. And let's pretend you didn't see that part or, you know, everyone, everyone usually has one or two, but they're just a little, a little cringy. I feel like this one has none. So I, I will say that I, I would call this excellent. I love it. All right. So we're, we're already, we got a good, we got an excellent. Jeroen, how many times and what would you say? I'm still in the rookie numbers compared to you guys. I'm still down to twice so far. I'm also intending to pump it up. And well, for me, it's a tough one as well. But I think I'm going to go with Calvin and say good because I can't really lean to excellent yet, though there is a lot in it that I really liked and some that I didn't, which I'm sure we'll go into later. We're definitely going to get into that. All right. So I've seen it four. Um, actually, Danielle and I are going tomorrow to see it a fifth time because we're doing a he said, she said video. So she wants to see it one more time. Um, outside of the Royal Albert Hall, where <laughs> yeah, it was a little difficult. Um, I would definitely go good. And I will say, um, since Joe did a little more talking after his one word, I'll do a smidgen uh, talking as well. I would go good. And if you had good leaning to excellent and good leaning to average, my good would actually lean to average. 
And mm -hmm. so that'll tell you a little something, but let's get into it. So we're going to do this just a little bit different. Now, there's a lot of reviews out there. All of them are excellent. The opinions are all over the place, but we're not going to sit here and start with the opening scene in Norway and then go to the song because everybody's doing that in order. We're going to do this very differently. We're just going to be four guys talking at a local pub. Some of us, if, if you do have a drink, even if it's a, a coffee, we'll hold it up. You can see maybe you're having a drink. Maybe it's happy hour right now. Cheers, everybody out there. Mm. Cheers. Cheers. Got a cute cup. Nice. Um, we're just going to be talking about the movie. So guess where I'm going to start? <laughs> the ending. <laughs> so I'm 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 going to kick it off. Um, these are my guests, so I wouldn't want them to to jump in the waters that deeply. But um, you probably have heard um, I did have issues with the ending. Here's why, and and it's interesting too because the issues I had the first two times I saw this film aren't the issues that I have it on the third and fourth time. Like I had issues with him just dying in general. And then I kind of stepped back and said, all right, I get it. Daniel Craig's James Bond had to die because they desperately tried in the five movies, which I thought was a bit of a blunder, was to create one story, even though they were kind of individual missions and just like Star Wars and unlike Marvel, uh, they didn't really have a plan to weave five movies together, which is why you have some of the disconnects that I felt. But to me, his death at the end of the movie wasn't the heroic death that would have been celebratory. You know, the queen and country, the larger than life. Um, I didn't buy the ticking clock. I mean, there's a host of other things. I really felt like he was incinerating himself and going up in flames to avoid killing his family, a woman that... He kind of just got back together and a, a child he just met. Now, I'm sure all of you out there are saying, God, David, you're the most evil person. Don't you have kids? Well, actually, I'm the only one out of these four people <laughs> that have kids. And I can tell you something. They're really cute and you get sleepless nights when they're born. Um, and then when they get older, they break your heart. And then when they get older, <laughs> they break your heart. And then they drive you to drink and give you stress. So. I don't know. I wouldn't blow myself up for a child. <laughs> That's just me. But Yarun, how did you feel about the ending? You know, this this got to be the most polarizing subject now in, in Bond. And it even polarized me. Like, I can argue for both sides. But I'm, I'm leaning more towards not liking it myself. I even have the, uh, the armband as solidarity for... Um, oh, my gosh. That's yeah, amazing. I, yeah, I mean, you know, we've got to have some form of respect for our uh, our hero dying here. It's a funny story, too. When I picked this up in the store, the guy actually went and sent me his condolences. He was like, uh, I'm sure you're going through a rough time. And I was like, uh, oh, yeah, you have no right. idea. <laughs> but, um, no, the, the ending for me, um, it it really left me feeling the first time I saw it, like, oh, they really did go there because we've been speculating whether or not they were going to do this. And I mm -hmm. was thinking like, oh, so they did. Second time, it hit me a bit more. But it's, you know, you remember that documentary, that uh, Everything or Nothing documentary from 2012, yeah. where they all of a sudden had uh, Bill Clinton on. And he was talking about how reassuring it is to people that, Bond has a position and Bond is, you know, uh, out there to save us. I uh, did not sleep me. with Madeline Swan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember that part. That kind of hit me like outside of the story, like Bond's position in our lives. He's sort of symbolically gone now. And I don't know, it felt it, this is not the ending I wanted. I wanted more like maybe a suggestion that he might still be alive or maybe something more like what they did with Mission Impossible, where he's forced to not be with Madeline anymore and he needs to be on the background in order to protect her. Something more along those lines. But yeah, it's uh, I, I can't say it's it's that terrible. It's also the way it is done, isn't it? Like it's the it's the navy, his own his own people, and you know we see the those <laughs> cruise missiles that. coming down full on on him. It's uh, it's not my type of ending. And, and one last thing, because I'm a teacher in real life, and on my second viewing, I one of the kids 
uh, that I have in class was actually in the room there. And after the movie, she came up to me. She's like an eight year old. And she's like, it was a really good movie, but there was no happy ending. And I was like, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. It's this, uh, and that's another shame, I think. Maybe Did you shake her and go, that's life, kid. This that's is life. life. <laughs> We're all going to die, you know. But yeah, it's. Welcome um, to the real world. Yeah. Well, but no, I mean, but that's, those are really good points because to me, and even to that child, Bond's always been to the left of reality. Like I've got a stressful life. You all have a stressful life. It's like, I'm, I go to a Bond film. I sit there in my living room to kind of escape those moments and the heaviness, especially the fourth time seeing it. Um, I, I'll be frank. I started to get a little, mm, a little bit cleft because I know like this character is about to like go up in flames, but we've got somebody in the room. Thank goodness that didn't call this good. They called this excellent. So yeah. I'm I'm dying to hear Joe Darlington was the ending excellent. Um I, yeah, listen, I'll be the guy. I, I it took I wasn't sure the first time I saw it either. In fact, I'll, I'll say this, I remember the first time I saw it um it, it was kind of you know again, trying to duck spoilers best I can. I'm it kind of got ruined for me a little bit. But yeah. but again, not only did we sort of see this coming, I actually did. In fact, I just went back recently and saw um about a year ago I, like when when the rumors came out about this i did a video on it and at the time i was sort of railing against it i thought i was like, oh i hope they don't do that that would be terrible whatever um fast forward to when i finally saw it first time i saw it i remember i i, I kind of was watching it very mechanically where I, I was sort of bracing myself that this was going to happen. So now I'm watching to see how they do it. And is this going to make sense? So when I saw it the first time, it, it it didn't really have the emotional punch that it should have. Then I turned over to my girlfriend and said, hey, what would you think? She's sitting there stunned silent. She literally can't even speak. And I, and I, I was like, oh, wow, am I cold and heartless? And I, I wasn't even the second time I saw it. Second time I saw it, now I'm now I'm just watching it and kind of letting it wash over me, and just enjoying it. Now the second time I'm a little misty. Um, it really it it kind of got me. Uh, so, do I like it? I tell you what, I can't imagine any other time where I would say yes, I actually do. I mean, if if they pulled this out of, out of this rabbit out of the hat in the '80s or '90s or whatever, and just decided, hey, I think we're going to end the film this way, I'd be like, are you are you crazy? Like what what's going on? I, but I feel like, like you said, because we we we've already been kind of treating the whole Craig era as kind of its own experiment. I I sort of walked away from this feeling like, you know what? I I kind of feel like in in a lot of ways this is the only way they could have ended this. Um, I mean, again, when they when they started Craig with Casino Royale, and we thought, oh wow, they're doing the first book. It's just like Fleming. So we thought maybe they're going to go back and do all of the books and, and we're going to we're going to do a whole Fleming thing from the beginning. And then Quantum comes out. It's like, all right, I guess not. They're just doing their own thing. And all the films have been, again, their own thing. And I remember even all, all of us sort of talking about Bond 25 and feeling like, you know, well, you know, should it be a standalone mission? And of course, once you sort of thought about it, it was like, well, I mean, at this point, could you imagine if they stopped the whole Craig arc thing and just had him walk and get a mission finish the mission and, and leave and that's the end of the movie you'd be like okay so I, I kind of feel like in retrospect this does feel like pretty it feels right it feels like it makes sense to me um you know and i think i like it i think we'll get into more details soon mm -hmm. so i won't go into every last little point i have about yeah. it um, but it did, there was a logic to it. And I felt like it did kind of make some good sense to, to end it this way. And I did feel like, like the second time I walked out and I'm hearing that music from Modern Majesties, I think the first time I saw it again, kind of like methodically, does that, do I like that? Does that make logical sense? The second time I'm walking out of the theater and that's playing, I'm feeling pretty good. Like this, this worked for me. I, and I'm as surprised as anybody, honestly. The, the entire community was surprised that you call this excellent in your review. Like there were people calling me and texting me, like <laughs> like 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 there was a new president or something. Like, did you hear? Did you hear? And I'm like, relax, everybody. Joe's clearly smoking something, and that's fine. It's legal in Jersey. No, but I I, I there's a lot of talk, Joe. You said something about Craig's tenure. There's a lot of talk amongst in the Bond community that. 
actually, the first two movies, you could argue Bond wasn't really on a mission. And then Skyfall, he's, you know, he gets shot, he gets angry, he's really not on a mission. Um, and then Spectre, he's kind of going rogue, so he's not on a mission. So you could have literally had the fifth movie as the only Bond movie where he kind of gets a mission and then still dies for Queen and Country, but has that kind of, but they went for relationship. I mean, and, and I get it that that's the Daniel Craig tenure, um, but Calvin, we got to go over to you. I mean, your 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 ending feelings. <laughs> uh, I, I'm probably going to be the most negative here, then I, I guess. Which is it's pretty good that we've got like a real mix of opinions for mm -hmm. uh, for this discussion. Uh, it's very unplanned this way. Hold I, on, I think. hold on. You said a negative one. I, yes. Okay, go yes. Ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I still like i've had to do some real like deep fan soul searching when it comes to this about just thinking about am i just against it because i'm a fanboy and i love this character and it's just horrible to see him just burn to a crisp before my eyes um or am i even if i wasn't a fan would i find it quite uh distracting and and contrived and on, four viewings in, I think it's the latter. I think the film really does, like earlier on when I said I've got very mixed opinions on it, it really does go off a cliff for me for the last like half an hour or so, building up to Bond's demise, which I just, I, I hate it. I really, uh, even after all this time, I, it did get a smidgen of an emotional response out of me on my fourth viewing. Specifically, there is a line that he has, and it's, um, I, I think it's, he's on the phone and he says, I'm not going to make it. I think he's talking to Q just he's going up the ladder. For some reason that triggered something in me and I was like, oh no, I'm gonna I'm gonna go here. And I did like a little tear welled up, but then the scene goes on and on and on. And then we have those landing scenes with the MI6 lot and then Madeline and Matilde driving off in the car, which are, all of which I hate so much. And uh, I can't remember, David, I remember, it might have even been you that said this actually, um, after we saw it for the second time together um, with a group and someone said, it might well have been you, um, that for that last scene, like once Daniel Craig gets to the top of that ladder and he gets out and he's seeing the view in front of him, it feels like he stopped being Bond and he is just Daniel Craig. And and that's how I feel every time I see it. And particularly hearing some of the, I read an interview earlier today uh, from Kerry Fukunaga, I can't remember, it was one of the, in fact, you, you might know uh, where it came from because I think it was one of the Dutch uh, sites that posted it where he said that he basically came on board and they told him, okay, this is the ending that we want. This He's gonna die at the end. You, and he, he had to kind of make it work because in the interview he says, Bond dying at the end is a result. It's not an ending. And that's kind of how I feel. I feel like it ends up being so contrived to get to a point where you feel like there is no other alternative because he's been shot multiple times. He's got this virus, which means he can't go near his family. There's uh, the Japanese and Chinese and Russian ships coming in. There's these other ships coming to get the nanobots. There's the missiles coming in. It's all just piling on top of each other, but it piles on top of itself so quickly that it, it feels so contrived to me because they're trying to convince you, no, 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 this has to happen. But ultimately it just feels like he just kind of gives up at the end. And uh, the whole nanobot thing, like, I'm not against nanobots. I love everything or nothing the video game. I'm totally cool with my nanobots in Bond. But uh, the, the whole contrivance of when Q's like, nope, they're eternal. That's it forever. Once they're yeah. in your system, that's it. I guess, I guess this EMP wouldn't work on the nanobots, just holding it up to his scratch. And going, <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, so that's, that, that's, that's kind of that's where I'm at. That's one of a list. It. Yeah. <laughs> but Calvin, that's that's good because um, I, I want to save our powder for talking about Bond and Daniel Craig as a character because we're going to have a whole mm -hmm. discussion on that. But um, Joe, I want to kind of dovetail it to you because as you hear Calvin, as you hear Jeroen and myself, um, again, the story would have had to have worked earlier for you than just those last 15 minutes for you to really say the ending is not only excellent, it's very befitting of Craig. Do you think the story that came before that served it up perfectly? So by the time you got there, you were like, absolutely. There, There is definitely something to be said for that. Absolutely. And, and I will, I will absolutely confess. I think, um, you know, I, 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 I shouldn't use this expression, but I, I could just be an easy lay when it comes to certain things. There, there were moments in the <laughs> film, in the buildup, that honestly, it was so good. I mean, I, I was, e even in the opening shots in Matera, not even just the views, but the cinematography, 
the, the, the there was like um when when bond was kissing her goodbye in the morning i'm gonna go do this i'll be back later there was like this kind of violet hue over that scene all the the colors the color correction every, i mean everything about this film was working for me so far there were so many fleming moments like real hardcore fleming ish moments to, to me that there probably was a, a, a point where i just sort of hit I, I hit a point of no return where i said this film could do no wrong i i'm on board with this i i am told i i've been one over um that could be um tainting my opinion of the finale uh but 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 again i i still go back to the idea that you really have to sort of look at this as a self-contained experiment this this is this was i mean like i said you made a point before about like well what if they ended the film or what if they ended craig's tenure with finally just giving us a, a bond film and i remember i mean the frustration that we sort of had all along with craig was like you know casino was supposed to be the origin story oh we're going to do a little more origin story in quantum and then by the end of skyfall okay i think i've i've seen the three-part origin story i'm ready for a film now then specter came along nope not quite like we like by the end of skyfall we thought for sure we're going to come just a regular old james bond film in the next one and eh, no nope, not not so much so honestly by the time this one came along I sort of feel like it, it would be weird now if if now suddenly for his last one they decided to do a one-off you know where, where it, it doesn't really fit into this bigger story so i i and honestly i said to myself going into the to the film like i mean you know and by the way one of my minor frustrations that i'm really sort of being aware of with this film i feel like when we see the trailer for the first time that's almost 50 percent of the experience you know, like like by the time we see the film, yeah, we are literally just watching to see how those puzzle pieces that we've already seen fall into place. You know, yeah. so I mean, so once we saw the trailer, Madeline is in it. We've seen, you know, the highlights of all the people that are going to be in it. We get an idea of what the story is going to be. Yeah. So again, I'm walking in already bracing myself for what's to come. So it's not like I was like, what? You mean he's not going to walk into M's office and get a folder and leak? I mean, we already knew that going in. So I, I so honestly, the the, the the sort of pregame had already sort of worked on me, I think. So, yeah. so it I, did seem to just fall in line, like the way I kind of felt like I guess it probably should at this point. And, and by the way, Joe, you bring up a good point that, you know, there was a time when we were all saying like, oh, the trailers have only been two to three minutes. Um, we're, we're talking about a three hour film. There's going to be so much more. And it really was just filling in the the lines of those yeah. trailers and just giving yeah. us more details it, but Yarun, i want to ask you something because this is this is a good meaty conversation this isn't just going scene by scene i love this but i'm going to ask you a question could they have killed bond off in a different way and you would have been satisfied or or better a different reason for him dying you know i can't think of, of a reason out of the top of my head now but Yes, I do think it could have been done differently. Um, but I'm more on board with, with Calvin that in the way that I rather not have my hero die that at way all. at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I get where Joe is coming from. Like it would have worked to have a standard ending again. But, but like I said, you know, I would have liked to see maybe put him in the background. He, he can't touch Madeline anymore. Maybe they could have kept that, but He's still alive. He's still going to survive, but he's going to be in the background, secretly still alive or something to, to yeah, get, Calvin, get, keep that feeling with us that he's still there. So to absolutely. Speak. And, and Calvin, I mean, I don't know if this is um, if this applies to you or not, but I remember seeing the movie and thinking, all right, if they hadn't amped up the relationship aspect and really his death is a little bit of him just saying like, you know, I'm I'm gonna give it all up for my family and my relationship and make it something a little bit more bondish. Would that have improved the ending at all for you? Oh, oh, um, yeah, uh, most definitely. Yeah, I mean, I would have even been like happier if I don't know. I was thinking like Skyfall and Judy's M in that film, and there is something about that film. It's not explicitly stated. I don't know if it's just the Thomas Newman theme that comes in for some of her scenes. It kind of sounds like a funeral march. Mm -hmm. Somehow you're kind of braced for it. It feels inevitable by the and by the time you get there, it feels like it's just completing this inevitable um, arc. Whereas with No Time to Die, I 
because the tone is so fun and frivolous earlier on, which I love, I absolutely love, I, I don't know if that's a reason why, it, it just feels odd and rushed by the time we get to the end, and particularly, it's just like very basic things, like he gets shot by Safin just fr from the side because he doesn't he didn't look left and see him. Like that's just such a it's such a small thing. And I think yeah. to your room's point as well, it's like trying to think of a scenario where it would work when we've seen him in so many <laughs> life and death scenarios. I know it's not this version of Bond that we've seen in all of the other um, situations, but I, I guess maybe it just as as a you know as fans, it's hard to get yeah. those instances out of your mind. So that's, and again, you guys are, it's, it's like, you know, my script or something like that, but <laughs> the, the odd or off things about this film, we're going to do a palate cleanser from the ending. Trust me, we'll come back to the plot, but I do want to talk about a conversation that's been happening in a lot of the reviews, a lot of the podcasters, not just the bond community, but Daniel Craig's performance is, uh, people are saying it, it's some of the best acting. Now you could take that as a separate thing. Like I said, he acted incredibly well. The question you have to ask yourself and people are asking is, did he act like Bond? And furthermore, did he act like Bond consist consistently throughout the film? When you go back and look at Casino Royale in the pre-title sequence in the black and white and he ruthlessly kills Dryden, I mean, ruthlessly, and he's got those short things and then the quantum and even um, the, uh, the big Whitehall scene in Skyfall with everything going on, and he's very cool and calculating. I found some disruptive moments in this movie where James Bond sounded like Daniel Craig, where at the end he's going like, plenty of time, Q, plenty of time. And, you know, I know, and I know. And even when he asks Mathilde, you know, how is it? And he kind of does that, how is it? That <laughs> seems like Daniel Craig would do that to his kids. And I felt like, I, when I immerse myself in a Bond film, I want to be in the Bond film until the credits roll. And I felt like all four times, I occasionally was being pulled out by James Bond, the character, being Daniel Craig, the person. Um, Calvin, let's go to you first. Um, did you have those moments? Were they odd? Or was was I smoking something? Oh no, I, I can totally see where you're coming from. There are moments, like I think of the Blofeld interrogation as a, a bit of a, he makes choices. He's very talky in this one. I feel like in the previous few, he, he didn't have an awful lot to say and it was kind of other characters reading from him and bringing him out. Whereas in this one, he's quite chatty. Um, I don't mind it though. I'll say like, I really like him in this film and what he does. Um, I think it's, it's a terrific, um, arc when you look at all five films he's doing something so different in each one and i feel like skyfall is his most fleming bond performance mm. specter is his most cinematic bond performance and then no time to die it, it it almost goes beyond that i don't know it goes into kind of new territory so i i, I guess i don't mind it so much um, but there are scenes where it's, you know, if you'd have told me that the bond of Quantum of Solace was going to have that scene that he has when he goes to Madeline's house in Norway and he's telling her how much he loves her and all that kind of stuff, I wouldn't have been able to imagine it. But I think he pulls it off really well. Um, and I think he actually elevates a lot of scenes, particularly with Madeline, by really selling you on the emotion of their relationship. So um, I can see where you're coming from, but but I, I, I still really enjoy what he's doing in this film. I like that. No, that's good. And and Joe, you know, since the documentary about your channel being James Bond came out, you seem <laughs> to be liking nice everything about this film. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying you have a contract and you're paid on the side, but um, talk to me about, did you get your badass Bond? Uh, was it consistent? Was it excellent? Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely got my badass Bond. And, and incidentally, by the way, you know, it's funny. I had a, somebody commented on on the review that I did something about like, Oh, these guys always have to be kind to these movies or else they don't get any freebies. And I rub back. I'm like, hey, I've never gotten a freebie in my life. And by the way, have you seen my reviews of Spectre and Quantum? <laughs> Trust me, if I don't like it, I'll tell you I don't like it. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I remember I felt like there was a lot of moments in this movie and probably going back to what you said earlier, the, the, the early parts of it got me in so well that I maybe I was willing to sort of turn a blind eye to some things that maybe didn't work empirically. Uh I kind of felt that all of Craig's moments, I, I've, I've always felt that Craig is probably the most Fleming Bond I think I've ever seen, frankly. I feel like he's, since from Casino till now, um, and it hasn't been a steady course, but but I, I feel like, you know, the, 
the, the Flemingish bond that we got in Casino is definitely the Flemingish bond we got in this. And what I really do like about the film is that I felt like it, it was willing to be pretty daring. Like it was willing to take a lot of risks and, and put James Bond in situations that were a tiny bit awkward. Now, I, I, I could totally see the argument, you know, like I could sit here and say, well, if if James Bond had a kid, this is probably how he would act. He, he's a killer with the heart with with a heart of gold, and, and he's probably a little awkward around the little kids. He doesn't have a how to handle the little kids. He's doing his best. Um, somebody might say to me, "That's fine, but I don't want the writers to write this situation from the beginning. Like, I, I don't want to see James Bond put in that situation. I don't care if he's responding the way Bond would respond in this situation. Just the fact that you're writing this situation." is not very Bond to me. And I totally get that. But honestly, I, I sort of fall back on the idea. I'm thinking of, like again, my Fleming Bond, who has been in very weird situations. I mean, I, I did a video recently where I was talking about the scene from Honor Magic Secret Service where Draco's, Draco is telling him to court Tracy. Yeah. He doesn't even say it that nicely, frankly. <laughs> and it's like, but that was Fleming. I mean, he th th he would kind of get into areas that are a little weird, you know, that we would not expect from our yeah. typical action heroes. So to see Bond in this situation, and by the way, he, th there is a suggestion in, in You Only Live Twice that he is going to have a child. This is something that you mm -hmm. know future authors would explore. Um, <clears throat> so I, I do sort of like that he was kind of presented with this situation and i totally also will acknowledge that like the death of felix Leiter, the death of bond i mean these are uh, the, the child I, these are all things that i would not have sat with me had it been any other situation than his yeah. you know he he this is then his final act so i i kind of feel like in that respect it kind of worked for me no it's it's it's, an, it's a great defense because even when i i spoke to um Daniel Craig, he said in the interview, like he goes back to Fleming and Fleming tried to kill Bond and Fleming did this to Bond. And, and you're right, it is a Fleming Bond. And my God, maybe I'm spending too much time with Calvin Dyson. But <laughs> I, I've, I've become very, very adequate of separating Fleming Bond and loving the books, loving, loving them, but not seeing them as the cinematic character of escapism and adventure. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I'm having trouble you know, putting them together and enjoying them thoroughly. I want, uh, gosh, I can't believe I'm saying this. Calvin, what have you done to me? I want those Moonraker <laughs> moments. Like in this film, and again, I say it's a very good film. It's a good <laughs> film. It's not a terrible film. It's a good film, but the, the parts that are good are when he's being the quantum Craig, um, when there's Moonraker moments, when there's great humor, when there's bombastic action, um, when he's doing the family different strokes thing, you know, you know, what you're talking about, Willis type things, it removes me. Yeah, it's Fleming, but it's putting me in the book and I'm not watching a book movie. And maybe that's the issue I'm having. But Jeroen, I'm hoping you can clear this up for all of us because <laughs> Bond, the character, Daniel Craig, talk to me. Uh, I, I don't think you can necessarily blame Craig for the things you've just mentioned. You know, you want to see, you know, not the kid or not this or more of a Bond type. This is the writers. You know, this is what they wrote for Craig. And I think he's been consistent in all of his performances. And you guys are right. He has been a very different in each one of them, you know, very Bondian, maybe in Skyfall or in Inspector, whatever you want to view it as. But yeah, I think he was great, actually. And this is what was given to him. And this is what he did with it. Yeah, that's that's how I view it, actually. Yeah. Uh, and I, I have also like the the child thing. That's another subject we'll probably get into later. You know, you could question how he even got a child to begin with after the torture scene in Casino Royale. How, how that all happened. <laughs> but um, it is fun to see. They did do a good job with him. I've, and the humor was there as well. Like when, when Madeline when Madeline goes, uh, I want there's something I need to show you. And Craig goes, uh, another Loved child? It. You know, to me, yeah. I, I cracked up. It's funny. It's different. You're yeah. right. It's not Bond as we're used to. But um, I thought... Craig was excellent. Um, yeah, and I yeah. I do too. I mean, I thought Daniel Craig was great. It was, there were moments of inconsistency, and I'm I'm really being not brutal to this movie, but I'm really trying to put it through the filter of being very discerning of the things that take me out of this movie because that that those were the things that said to me, I'm suddenly not in a James Bond film. 
um, those right. tiny little moments in a beautifully acted situation. Now, Yarun, we're gonna your voice is warmed up, so we're gonna keep with you because you opened up the doors. We've got to talk about the family affairs. So this is something, and again, Daniel Craig said it in the interview that I had with him of the relationship aspect that they opened up in Spectre was too good not to start there. That's literally where the writers, and I'm sure he had a hand in this too, started and said, let's take this relationship, amp it all the way up. And they did to the point where the relationship went pop and out came a little kid in a James Bond film. So how did that work for you? The, the family surround sound. You know, I did like the child actor they got for Matilda. She, she or Matilda, she was she was great, and I, yeah. I, I did f start to feel for her when when Craig gets her little doo doo in the climax. It's it's oh. so different to what we're used to, but it also is kind of obvious to me that they kind of wrote the child in because this is the last film. Now they can try everything and to kind of bring the Madeline and Bond relationship to the next level, because I think it was missing playfulness. It was missing chemistry more like it wasn't the Vesper relationship to me. It was better than Inspector. Madeline was good, but I think the child was to, was brought in to, to, to ramp that relationship up, to, you know, to, to bring it to the next level. Um, and, and there were some plot holes with it, too. I was so confused first time I saw the movie and the child appeared. I was like, well, who took care of the child when, when Madeline was in London? Like, like she's been in Norway this whole time. Like, <laughs> how does that happen? It's, it's so, yeah, I started questioning some of it, but I'm not necessarily against it. I, I don't have like huge gripes with, um, with him having a kid. I mean, this is, this is, you know, a one-time or, or, opportunity to do it, I guess. Or how about this? How about the fact that nobody, I mean, she was pregnant for a while and working for MI6. Nobody from MI6 got back to Bond. I mean, <laughs> he's not exactly living in a cave somewhere, you know, like the Taliban. He's, yeah. he's, he's you know, in Jamaica. And, um, M you know, even has a line like M has like we kept her under surveillance for five years yeah. and then later on when Bond's in the car with Nomi saying like oh I didn't know she had a daughter so like, we obviously didn't keep her under that close surveillance if she could be pregnant and have a kid <laughs> but, for five years. But Blofeld knew, you know, yeah. you know obviously <laughs> Safin he, knew. It's he like, didn't have an eye on her. <laughs> yeah. MI6 you gotta get your act together. So Calvin, were you? how were you with the whole family? Oh, I was totally good with that, actually. Okay. Um, I, I thought it was handled very nicely. Um, and with it being Craig's last one, uh, it, it felt kind of natural to heighten the emotional stakes in, in that way. I guess the thing that I, I still get kind of hung up on, even after four times watching it, is the reveal that she actually is his kid, because it feels very muddled and buried in all this, because there is that really funny moment where Madeline says she's not yours. And everyone in the cinema laughs every time. And then, you know, another child line that always gets laughs. But then as an audience member, you know, I take that to mean that she's not actually Bond's daughter. And I know that there's a double meaning to that phrase from Madeline because she's, it could be interpreted as she's literally not your biological child, or it could be interpreted as um, I don't want anything, you to have anything to do with her. Um, but then later on, I think the, actual reveal that she is his daughter she is intended to come at the end when Madeline says she has your eyes but preceding that we've got all these scenes with Safin who seemingly knows that it's the biological child so that's all it's all very messy I don't know it's a lot of this third act issues um but when she's introduced I love that scene uh, I think the child actor is really good for a for a kid actor it's amazing yeah um so no none of that that bothered me um at all it's it's more the writing and the reveal but the in in concept i was yeah totally good with it that's great and joe i think i know what you're going to say but say it anyway well I'll, i i in in the spirit of being contradictory and i get that from my oh. mother um I, I i i actually will say there were moments in here that you know i don't think the film is perfect i i like even though i said it's an excellent film I, it, hmm. it's not flawless and I do think there were a lot of moments where, you know, even I'm sort of talking to the screen saying, you know, like, well, you know, if, you did, if you just explain that just a little bit better, I think it, it would have made more sense. Um, the fact that he has a daughter, again, to me, is not a problem per se. I, I even like it. And I sort of already kind of went to bat for it. Um, I will say that we are kind of 
I, I think even the one, even all of us who are a little more critical of the film, uh, are probably being very kind in not mentioning that it's it, this is also very derivative. Um, this there's a lot of franchises that went down this road. Uh, the hero now has a child, um, and the hero is going to die at the end uh, in a self-sacrificial way. Uh, so I, I I do have to acknowledge, yeah, that 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 is a, a problem I have with it. Um, in fact, uh, my my brother was the one who said to me after he saw it for the first time, he, he said, "Boy, this this Craig Craig franchise has really just been the Dark Knight trilogy." He says, "You know, Casino Royale was Batman Begins, Skyfall was the Dark Knight, and now we're ending off with the Dark Knight Rises with with the big death scene." And I was, yeah, kind of. Um, so yeah, I but I, but I, and and by the way, as long as I'm being a little critical, uh, I I kind of felt that the scene in the house where Bond shows up and they have that conversation and then <clears throat> Matilda appears at the top of the steps. I, I did. That was sort of the first time I felt that the actual like scenery was a little clunky. I kind of felt that the, the house was very small. It, it almost felt like kind of a reshoot. Like we just had to sort of go back and shoot Ooh. this real quick. And it didn't have that same vibe that everything up until that point had. I mean, everything to me up until then was very larger than life. Most of the, all of the shots, all of the settings, etc. cetera, Ooh. That seemed just a tiny bit claustrophobic and, and kind of un, uninspired. Um, but to get back to your initial question, I, with those criticisms aside, I think that him having the daughter is, is is okay. I do I do see it as kind of a mature step in the Bond series, and again, only in something that we know is going to be the finale. Would this be okay? So I, I was I was okay with it, and it did it did raise the stakes the way it meant to. I, I did sort yeah. of get that feeling like now the stakes are bigger. Um, him running through the forest with her in his arms, I think I, it was working for me. So I thought that was pretty good. I kind of like this conversation already, um, 45 minutes in, because a lot of people said, oh, you got interviews with them and you went to these events. You know, clearly you're going to say the film is excellent. I may be coming off as the most negative one with this film um, unapologetically. <laughs> I think the three because, of you are competing, frankly. <laughs> well, and I'll tell you why, because and I said this publicly already, so this is going to be a repeat. I was OK with the family, but not great. Um, do I want every Bond film, like Bond 26 and 27, for him to be a family man and go, honey, I'm home, and oh, I got to get to work and go kill some bad guys? Hell no, because I am a family man, and I'm not looking, unlike Safin says, to see my own reflection. I'm looking to see a guy who's a son of a bitch, a little bit of an asshole. He's an assassin. He's cold-hearted. He's a bit misogynistic. I mean, these are things I'm not, happily. None of you are. But you know something, this is um, this is an adult fantasy. And so if we're going to play that game, but you're going to insert these family moments, you're surrounding it with great action. Trust me, I'm not going around in my Aston doing donuts and shooting people. <laughs> but, you know, the whole family thing, I don't know, it just it, it, it brought something to the point where even Danielle was like, I think at the end of the film, she said something like this was a great film uh, that women will love that happens to have bond in it. And I thought, yeah, I mean, I can't say that, but I mean, yeah, she's <laughs> absolutely right. Um, so it, it it's going to mesh to the next subject line, and this is going to be a big one. And we can make this as big or as small as you want. So this is entirely up to the wonderful crowd I have before me. So we've got to talk about the writing and the plot, plot points and plot holes. Um, and again, I'll start because I, I still think this is a, a very good film. Joe thinks it's excellent, but I think we would all agree. As, as long as this film was, two hours and 46 minutes, I still get the feeling after seeing it four times that there's a longer film there. Like there were moments with Safin, is he doctor? No. Um, what, could there have been more explanation or something more with the Poison Garden, which they spend eight minutes on and nothing happens with it. You know, Safin goes from being this henchman, a family of people that poison for Spectre, okay. And then suddenly he's this giant, you know, wealthy guy who has nanobots. And, and I'm not sure why he's looking to kill all these people. Well, could you have woven this better? And by the way, this is after four viewings and I consider myself a semi-smart guy. I, I don't think anybody should be overly intelligent and watching a Bond film and miss why things are happening and why they're connecting. So although I really like the way things are woven, I think that there's some 
gaping holes in the plot and the writing. Calvin, you mentioned writing before. Let's start with you. Yeah, I think it's... Do you remember when they did that... Uh... The, the announcement of the film and all of the cast were in Jamaica at GoldenEye and stuff, and we all came away from it being like, oh gosh, I really hope they know what they're doing, because no one looks like they have a clue. Um, anyway, that that's aged well, um, all this time <laughs> later. Um, and, and, you know, and that's fine. Not not every, you know, big major film has a completed script and a full set of storyboards going through every single scene by the time they start shooting. But I think you can see that there has been some, and particularly now that we're hearing through some of the behind the scenes interviews and and and, and um and the like, um, it, it it feels like it was a bit run and gun at times, the uh, the process of making this film and Kerry Fukunaga's having to pick up a, I think they're really lucky actually that they got a director like him who's also a writer so that he can really help them fill in these holes and uh, and like Daniel Craig has, you know, he's a producer, he, he has a say in what they do with the character, so he's sort of having to tailor things to meet with what he wants to do, uh, like killing him off at the end and all these things. Um, plot wise, I, like I say, like, I, I don't need, as you said, David, you don't need like, you know, this is a series where a guy just really likes water and he wants everyone to live in it. And that's motivation enough that that's fine. Here, I remember like coming out of the Albert Hall with you and, um, you know, the sound isn't very good. So you can't really hear things you think okay oh maybe i missed something even four viewings in i'm still kind of like i don't know if all of his motivations are in the film exactly there is the making of book uh, which is really good which i've skimmed through which does shed some light on some motivations um, But even rami malik when you hear him talking about the character i'm not even sure he had a full handle on it by the end uh, they talk about him being well, well he's deliberately mysterious and all this kind of stuff and it's like did you just not fill in the blanks and it's really like i remember speculating so much on the trailer stuff like he has the bullet hole in like where his heart would be and thinking like right. well that's a fleming thing that's dr no and then um there's all these little things in there you know thinking like oh de-aging must be a part of the plot because he's in that flashback and then he's you know in the thing later on and he looks like like he does and turns out none of that <laughs> mattered for anything he one just... of the henchmen even calls him a doctor yeah right it's and like it his, feels it, it's literally oh. you know it's a no <laughs> of course <laughs> love it it's it's a no mask that he wears <laughs> so yeah, yeah i i'm not too sure oh, what happened good. there it's just do that if, for calvin I, I love that. Thank you. That was a big surprise as well. I wasn't expecting any props for this one. Uh, but it's just all, all these little things that it feels like there was something else going on here rather than just he was wearing body armor and is a doctor <laughs> and just took really good care of his skin, apparently, uh, to age that well. Um, but um, no, it, it, it feels like there are a lot of holes. I think for the most part, they do a really good job of just rushing you through things so that you don't really focus on it. And that's fine. Uh, I, I'm all good to go with the ride as long as I'm enjoying it. Watching a film is not a logistical checklist of real world logic. Um, but by the third act, you do need some of that there, like really clearly, like what the villain wants. That that's a big one, and it's it's yeah. not there. And, by, and and you bring up a good point because I felt like at times with this film, it was almost like you know, Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin film where they put too many characters in a film. You had to have Felix, you had to have Blofeld, you have Madeline, you have to have a new 007, you have to have all these things. Would it have been better, I wonder, just reeling that back a little bit, making it maybe this is Blofeld's real movie. You have Safin as a henchman because I had trouble wrestling with the Safin character and his why and his plot points. But in addition to that, you had all these stop-start moments that... Yes, it advanced the story lightly, but even introducing Blofeld in that scene, could you have done without that and still had the ribbon of storytelling? Absolutely. You just found a lighter way to do it. So I almost felt like this is like, we've got to either kill off all the characters or we've got to get through them all, check them off, have the Scooby gang. And it's it just seems like a lot all at once. But Yarun, you may have felt very differently. No, I completely agree with you two on this. There were, um, and first of all, I'd like to respond to, to Kelvin before I delve oh. into the plot holes, but it's, I, I agree that it feels like they must have thought about making Safin Dr. No at some point. But there's also the, the Ken Adam inspired film set where you have like the holes in the ceiling that look totally like Dr. No. They must have 
maybe during production they got the backlash where it's like oh they already know that this is this is uh Oberhauser all over again they already guess let's just not make him doctor no or something and the same with with the plot i'm still convinced like the nanobots or not convinced but i'm speculating the nanobots at some point must have been like a virus because they the the scientist you know he makes the ebola joke and the virus related stuff and then later it becomes the nanobots it just seems like because of the obvious pandemic going on like they well i can completely understand but they changed a lot later on uh with backlash i don't know but uh, for the the plot holes yeah i was massively confused with a lot of it as well like one of the the big ones for me was and, and I've only had two viewings, so maybe you guys can clear it up. But it's the part where Blofeld goes, when her secret finds his way out, it will be the death of you. And I'm like, like how? So what is the big secret then of Madeline? Is it that she had a child or is yeah. the secret? But how does Blofeld know? It's like, and, and how would that be the death He knows of and Safin knows because Safin uses uh, Mathilde to even so she sprays the nanobots because, you know, she says, like, you don't have anything that you could hold against me. And he's like. Oh, I do. I do. So they know. Yeah, but it seems so, you know, at the first time I saw it, I thought the secret was that Safin pulled Madeline out of the ice, that she mm. actually got rescued. And because she had to give up her past in the beginning, like, forgive me, uh, the, the masked man, that was the big secret in the beginning. But then later it turned out after she got pregnant, of course. And by that, the way, does Safin, do you get the sense you're in that, does Safin love Madeline? Yeah, and that that was another thing I got on my first viewing. Um, when Because I fell for it. Like, it's not your child. I was like, oh, so is it Safin's then or something? Yeah, that's the, the first thing I thought when, when she said that. Um, and also because of the line... Um, we the line we i could be speaking to my own reflection and beforehand he actually mentions you know uh, we we love uh yeah. or something like we love, love madeline. madeline or something so yeah and it seems very underdeveloped especially like you guys just mentioned like i loved safin's introduction the pre-title sequence i think yeah. is one of the strongest yet it's, it's horror movie like it's totally not like the sam mendes movies very different opening very cool um, you're immediately pulled in and like, okay, Mr. White killed his parents. Okay, um, I see his background. He wants revenge. This this is cool. But then later, all of a sudden, he wants to like kill the whole world or, or like infect the whole world with the nanobots. And it's unclear. Same with the Garden of Death that seems added in there. And then Mathilde, it's, it's a lot that seems very underdeveloped for his character. Yeah, well, happily... We have Joe Darlington in the room to right. clear all clear of this all up. up. <laughs> Joe, help yeah. us. I, you know, honestly, I'm saying to myself, maybe, you know, maybe sometimes, like, if the movie gets you early enough, I'm just real easy, and I'm because I feel like I sat there, like, like every time I talk about Spectre, I'm like, it doesn't make any sense. You know? But this, I felt that this one, I really didn't have any problem with the plot. I did. I mean, I will say this. It, I didn't feel that there were a lot of plot holes, but I would say that the story does feel a little flabby. Like it's like when you talk about like a white wine, sometimes that you know, sometimes they're very tight, sometimes they're they're flabby. And I, I find that this the story here feels a little flabby, like it's just not tight. Um, but I didn't really find anything that I would call a hole. In fact, I, I think that there were some times when they were um, going overboard, like again, like him with the nanobots getting infected at the end, they went so overboard to, to make sure that we understood that this is a permanent thing. And, you know, we have to make sure we say this earlier in the film. So when people go back later, they can't say that we didn't say it. Um, but, but the flabbiness, yes. Uh, I totally agree. The, the garden of death doesn't go anywhere. His, his motivation to want to take over the world and kill people, they, they, it just, it's just sort of there, um, but, but I did, I, but even those things though, I can't really kind of come back, and it, it's not like there's direct contradictions where I say, well, this doesn't make sense because of this. It was just kind of like, like a little loose in places, and, and frankly, and again, I, I think a lot of that is natural, and maybe I'm just being over forgiving. I mean, th th there's a scene when, um, there's that th that scene where when M and Bond are talking, and they're they're ready right, right along the river. Mm -hmm. And having a conversation, and, and that Majesty's music is playing. Yeah. Um, and I remember hearing later that the whole reason that scene is even there is because 
Daniel Craig had had, had, had an injury. So rather than sh shoot uh, an action scene that day, they just chilled out and had a conversation and they didn't even know where this was going to go. Um, and even I, I sort of later on, you know, the whole scene that everyone loves with Paloma, like that was literally the last thing they shot. You know, that like if you watch that uh, mm -hmm. being James Bond documentary, no connection, by the way, uh, they, they they tell you that, that that final scene of him running off with, with right. the scientist was literally the last thing they shot, which sort of said to me later, I think they went back. They probably wanted to put her in the movie, so they went back and shot this and added it. And plus, they figured we, we need some bondish sort of stuff, so they put that scene in there. That's why I and I I said in my review, I said that whole scene to me almost felt like a com commercial where we kind of just stepped out of the of the story for a second, had a had a couple fun Bond moments with a fun Bond girl, and it was you know really fun. And then we kind of get back to the narrative. Uh, so yeah, I, I I do find there's a lot of places in here that just that just sort of feel a little lopsided right but, but i really don't find a lot of places where i can be really critical and say wait a second they said something else earlier and that doesn't make any sense they seem to try to make it all work even if it's a little clumsy at moments but but you're actually you're supporting the idea that this is kind of like building an airplane while it's on the runway because you know you've got for example safin leaving safin gets uh, his island gets bit by the girl unexplicably tells her to go run off why um if you're yeah. that connected but then then all of a sudden he goes away with five to six henchmen he disappears then daniel craig runs across the water and it's only saf and suddenly back i guess he decided no yeah. no no henchmen no 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 you go you but go and, and i i would i i would totally agree with that but honestly i, I isn't there a lot of bond movies where the, the 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 evil villain who normally bond would have no problem taking taking him out very quickly does that move where he gets the drop on him? Tomorrow never dies comes to mind. Um, Quantum comes to mind. He got the drop on James Bond. So now when they have some fisticuffs, it's it's kind of evenly matched yeah. and stuff. So yeah, listen, I I agree with that. I I can't argue with it, but but I will say it's not different than a lot of other. By the way, films. it's very interesting that you named two movies that I adore are in my <laughs> like top eight. However, I will admit they have relatively weak bad guys and relatively weak endings. And that's exactly what I thought this suffered from. Look, this would be an excellent movie. This would actually climb higher in my ranking, which we're going to do at the end. Spoiler. Um, but the reality is, is that these plot holes, a weak, weak bad guy, an ending that isn't celebratory in a moment that I wanted to celebrate, those are the things that that pull this down from excellent to good. And, and you actually just defined it perfectly, Joe. It's like, it's those things. And I think if you... You have the wonderful advantage, and I envy you. I'm not upset. I actually envy you that you got into the movie and you said, I'm in it for the ride no matter what happens. You kind of knew what was going to happen. Calvin and I were sitting in Royal Albert Hall, squished like this, like wet wool rats, <laughs> you know, from the rain <laughs> pelting down. And I honestly had forgotten everything about the fact that Bond could have died. So we're just watching this. And as he's climbing the ladder, I remember looking over at Danielle, I had Mark O'Connell here, I had Calvin there, I had my wife sitting in between us. And I remember looking over at her and she was just staring at the film because I was thinking to myself, he's climbing the ladder, they're gonna kill him. And I have a feeling they're gonna kill him and they're not gonna make it nebulous like the Dark Knight. I have a feeling they're just gonna kill him. And so it was this, this kind of like, I think what happened was, I'm, I'm, you guys are my shrink now. I think <laughs> the plot points, all the issues I'm having with the film are amplified. They're magnified because of the, the, the killing thing that went on with one of my characters. It's almost like looking at someone that shot a dog and it's my favorite dog. And I'm like, you effer, how could you shoot a dog? Now, everything with that person is suspect. Yeah. And I'll that's tell you what, probably I, what's happening. I, I, let me, I want to make two two points, and then I promise to shut up for a little while. You don't need um, to. There were two things that come to mind. You know, I I, I mentioned earlier, when I went into the film, um, it was more or less spoiled, but I still had that sort of open mind thinking that they could do that, where, you know, he seems like he was killed off, but then the la in the last shot, there he is standing off in the distance, and, oh, he didn't really die after all, great, and that's again. Um, but I, I, I sort of felt like if they had done that, I don't think I would have felt better because I sort of feel like at that 
point, it simply would have been just another narrative choice that they could have used. Another another cinematic tool to sort of put a, a different kind of punctuation on this instead of seeing it through and saying, no, 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 he, he really did die. Uh, so I, I don't think that would have made me feel any better. But, and, and, but one more point I want to make, too. I think as I was sort of contemplating, I mean, there was a lot of conversation after the film about, like, Okay, did he just commit suicide because he can't see his family, or is he kill? Is he is he sacrificing himself because he's a danger to them? And I kind of you know went back and forth with it, and then on multiple viewings, I kind of went, no, I, I think that's the point. And I, and and actually, you mentioned it in your review, David. I think Danielle was the one who said it. Yeah, that if he if he continues to exist, just his existence at some point will probably be their undoing. And that I think that's what it kind of hit me. You, you know, the, I, I'm doing a lot of parallels between like Logan. Um, Avengers Endgame, where, where this kind of played out, but I, I, you know what a better comparison I think is? Remember Terminator Two? Yeah. The end of Terminator Two, they throw the, the <laughs> right, they throw, they throw in the chip, they throw in the arm, and then he says, he goes, but there's still one more chip, and and he realizes that as as long as he exists, he, he it's it's always going to be a danger. That was sort of how I, that was my parallel. I kind of thought, with that in mind, I. Again, I think I'm okay with 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 the ending, and, and you know, again, I, I it's definitely not going to be everybody's brand of vodka, that's for sure. Did you just but, compare Terminator to James Bond? I guess I, guess I kind of <laughs> did. Public, but the good Terminator. Yeah, the good Terminator. <laughs> all right, well, all right. So we need to do a little bit of happiness celebratory uh, one hour in palate cleanser. Um, we've got to move to, and Yarun, we're going to do you first. That came off terrible. Uh, the James Bond <laughs> channel, though. Your room, get ready. We're going to do you first. Um, let's talk about our favorite moment of this film. There had to be moments. Of course there were. We love this film. It's a great film. Uh, it's a good film. So, Yeroon, there had to be a moment that stands out where you're like telling your friends like, oh, this, but that this one part, what is that part? You know, the it might surprise you but the the thing that hit me much more emotionally compared to what i think the ending was supposed to do was the moment with vesper uh when mm -hmm. when he's standing in front of her tomb and it's the very simple thing of him saying i miss you and it just it, it really yeah. hit me that that one line which i think that's great is what quantum of solace should have done that that tiny moment was more powerful than the entirety of what quantum i think should have because that was the, the part where he was supposed to find that solace now he, he really did here just a really tiny moment um yeah to hear craig said it because we all know vesper it's been part of our lives for like 15 years now 2006 yeah. something like that quick math or what is it 16. 15 yeah. but and they whatever. only knew each other for a few days that's powerful yeah but to, to hear craig to, to, the way that was written i don't know i i really liked the the pre-title sequence and mainly the the first half of the movie the most uh the action scene with the db5 everything that's in the opening all top notch i i think that that that's the action that really got me and also, I gotta mention Anna the Armors, of course, which you guys already mentioned. I don't think anyone's negative about her. Uh, she's amazing yeah. in this this tiny moment. You just mentioned, I think it was Joe that said it was kind of like a commercial, but a really good commercial. I think it's like the the the, the moments that it's the just you can I can really fanboy about that stuff where they they do the quick salute and then the music pops up yeah. and dun, 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 and they go out. It's Bond is being a badass. And then she kind of one-ups Nomi as well by driving into the scaffolding to get the, the scientist. All terrific. That, that, yeah, that really, uh, those are the moments that stand out to me, surprisingly. Yeah. And like I said, the Vesper moment was more emotional to me. That got me a little teary more than seeing my hero die, surprisingly. Yeah. Just a tiny moment. So, yeah. that's Those are great picks. And I love how you started with the Vesper one because it's going to make me look even more the child man that i am because um and i don't know if joe's not going to talk to me after this uh recording or not but cuba and again it's the influence of calvin over these last few <laughs> lockdown months um cuba for me is my standout moment because it was so much fun with the eyeball with specter with him walking amongst all these agents that 
he must have known clearly. Um, Anna de Armas's, you know, adorable acting and then her badass action, uh, the drinking, the tray, you know, the Nomi coming down like Batman, you know, the gunshots, the, the kick ass, the music during this part was dun, 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 you know, and he falls down off the thing. And he's, I even love the befuddled way he gets up. And then what does he do to steady himself? Like we all do down a drink, you're bond again. I mean, yeah. those to me <laughs> are 24 movies accumulated into a scene. Now, I'm going to defend Joe. Would I want an entire movie of that Cuba scene? No, I don't want that. But to me, that was so much fun and such a wild palate cleanser. Because um, I thought to myself, is it going to be the quarter scene? I love the quarter scene in Matera. I love that. There's so many scenes I love. But Cuba, to me, is the one that I'm going to hold in my heart. And Calvin, I saw you cheering. What What is it for you? Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm going to cheat and have two as well, um, if that's okay, because yeah. I'm just going to join in the um, the love on for that whole Cuba sequence. For like, as soon as Bond arrives there and Nomi's on the other dock and she like flips him off and then that you just know they're in conflict to get this scientist. I love the, the bald guys with the eyeball on the tray going around. It's Blofeld's birthday party. It's ridiculous <laughs> and it's fun and it's exciting. I love all the, all the Spectre agents. He's going into a big Spectre, it, it, like... They, he knows that they've seen him before. Like, yes. surely he's on their number one, like, most wanted <laughs> list. But he kind of knows that they're watching him, and they know that he... It's just got this really fun, like, nice vibe to it. I really love that whole sequence. Anna Darmus is incredible. Um, I think uh, there are so many great lines in it. I love Nomi when she says, when uh, the scientist asks, what you're, where are you taking me? And she says, I'm taking you back to Mother Darling. I think everyone has lovely lines in this whole yes. sequence. Um, so yeah, that, you know, from as soon as he arrives in Cuba up until him and the scientist are on the plane going off, it's just sensational. I would take a whole film of that. I would love a whole film <laughs> of that vibe. It was like, oh yes, this is where I want to be. Um, and then I'm also going to go for a quieter scene as well. Mm. Um, I think, uh, the scene between Bond and M, uh, in the office, uh, not too long after the Cuba scene, actually, where Bond goes back to London for the first time in a while, um, and he has the whole thing about, has the desk gotten bigger or have you gotten smaller, and those kinds of lines. I assume that that's a Phoebe Waller-Bridge polished scene, because there is some fantastic dialogue in that. Um, and my God, you're thirsty today, all that kind of stuff. But I love that we're yeah. seeing Bond and M in a situation where Bond doesn't need to care, actually. He's like, I, I'm, I'm just going to tell it like it is. You are not my boss anymore. I don't care about this. And the fact that Mallory has done an awful lot of bad stuff. He is kind of a Dr. Frankenstein figure in this story, um, in his role in, in developing Heracles. So I just, I love seeing a different a dynamic to that scene. Um, and then I love all those scenes in London. I love when he's out with Money Penny and Nomi in the corridor and people are like 007, like looking at them both. Yes. I love that. I love the scene in Q's house. That whole like London chunk um, really works for me. I really love all of that stuff. I agree. I agree. All right, Joe, you get to have at least two since we're just piling on, which is good. I mean, we've got to we've got to bring the love back for this movie. Well, well, I, I have the fun. See, it's fun when you go last because then you can comment on everything that came before. <laughs> um, you, you know, keep keep me with it with the idea that I I can be critical of this film. I, I remember kind of feeling like okay, continuity is a little wonky because I remember the, this the scene where it goes to Vesper's grave, which I by the way I will absolutely agree. It was interesting that after five movies of Vesper, we're like, all right, we're Vesper now. Like, like, in this finally, I, I kind of thought like that moment did sort of make a lot of a lot of good sense, and I did get a good good feeling from it. Then there was another voice in my head, kind of going, "So Vesper is Italian now, I guess, <laughs> or whatever. Fine, okay, fine." Um, but uh, and and by the way, I have to agree that the the scene with Paloma I, again. I think this is a good example of why, like, like I, I mentioned earlier, I think this must have been the last thing they they shot because this was the the last shot they filmed. So this might have fallen under rewrites or just sort of course corrections as they were moving forward. They kind of said we need a little more fun in this, and they threw this in, and I think it adds to the overall experience. You know that like I would say this is a very essential part of the film and the very essential part of the whole vibe I get from the whole thing as a whole. Um, if I have to pick one moment that just kind of got me. It was Bond in Jamaica, and I think the scene of him on the boat, getting off the boat, carrying two big fish and a and a, a harpoon gun. I'm like, done. That's it. You got me. You won me. <laughs> I was totally on board with this movie. That totally got me. I literally, I came home. I, it must have been after my third viewing. 
I met Mary afterwards. And I said to her, I said, by the way, you realize we have to redecorate the entire house. <laughs> we have to just tear everything down that we did. And we have to redecorate it to look like bonds. We have to have stacks of books on every table. I don't care if I read them or I don't, but they have to be there. <laughs> um, so, I, yeah, I think that was the moment that it really, this just totally won me over. And I, I think, again, it, it made me very, very susceptible to everything else that came later. <laughs> Yeah, and I think I think that's a great point too, Joe. Because I forgot about Jamaica. Jamaica's fantastic. I mean, everything about it, the interactions with Felix. Um, there's so much to love with this film. And again, and I'm not trying to draw it back to to the negatives, but I think that's why if 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 the ending had been a little bit more of what I was getting throughout the whole movie, if I hadn't had that turn so much. Now, I like that you like it. But you're you're um, you're much more sophisticated than I am. I, I kind of wanted these, you know, <laughs> interplay of bubblegum moments. I said that out of politeness. I don't know that uh, for sure. But um, but, but right. again, I, but honestly, but just I'll I'll do this quick. I think yeah. again the the offset of that kind of fun over the top Spectre party versus scenes like that. Honestly, I kind of felt like it's it that is where I get my good complexity, and that's uh, my my wine analogies are going to go off the charts today. But but all of that together, I, I think that's why I, I get such a good vibe of the film as a whole, because it's complex. It has different elements that, that that kind of in some way fit. Yeah. No, I get it. I get it. All right. We've got to talk about a subject. Um, this could go a lot of different ways. I'm actually going to go last. So as not to taint anything, not that it would. Um, Yeroon, we're going to start with you. Um, there was a lot in both interviews, the trades, uh, even the Bond community, about this film potentially being woke or Me Too or the women were going to take the mickey out of Bond and, you know, Bond was going to be seen as a buffoon. Um, and then you had Paloma, you had Nomi, and you have Madeline, and dare I say you had Matilde. I don't know the sex of Dudu, so I'm not going to include <laughs> Dudu. But you you had women in this film. Oh, let's not forget Money Penny. Um what was your takeaway? Do you think the hype was justified or was it just that hype? You know, you know, I got to be honest. I was among those people that was having concerns um, if this was going to go too far into woke territory, uh, which isn't necessarily all bad, by the way, because a lot of it I really, really thought like, yes, this this fits. An example for me is... Um, Q turns out to be homosexual, which I thought was, oh, that fits him. That's, that's, that's kind of nice, actually. That's, you know, I don't have any problems with that. And my concerns were with Lashana Lynch, how, how the 007 thing was taken and how, you know, we all know how that was going in the, the lead up. And I got to say, I was kind of relieved uh, that it wasn't as bad as I, in that territory of wokeness, so to speak, at all. To my taste, I loved a lot of it. Um, I, I I wasn't the biggest fan of all of Lashana. I was actually, and this sounds really childish, I know. I was kind of relieved when the 007 thing got reinstated to Bond. I know it, it makes sense in the story, or maybe not. I didn't really got like when the respect all of a sudden grew so much for her to all of a sudden reinstate it after being very childish about it. Like, which 00 are you now? What, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I enjoyed Lashana, ironically enough, a lot more after it was reinstated. Um, I still believe there was some some moments where I felt like, yeah, this is this is kind of shining through that that maybe the woke agenda, so to speak. For me, a moment. I don't know if you guys agree, but the, there is the the moment with the um, the scientist guy. I, I, I keep forgetting his name, um, but in the the climax where. Yeah where he all of a sudden goes out on Lashana like I could wipe out your entire ethnicity and, and on my Dutch subtitles it even even said your race mm. and I was like where where does this come from and it gives her this you know um kind of a black lives matter moment I guess the kick ass and kick her off I felt that was forced in forced writing like yo get, get a statement in maybe that's me of course you know but Overall, was it woke? No, not not to my annoyance too that I see uh, among other people that are really against all of this. Um, and uh, yeah, I was, but I was glad the 007 thing got reinstated, even though I might sound like uh, sound like a big child saying that. But it mm -hmm. uh, to me, it meant a lot that Bond got it back. 
even I think if it was just a story thing. Yeah, I think it was much talked about. I actually felt not upon first viewing, but subsequent viewings, it was relinquished back to Bond almost too easily. Like she was taking, you know, she was very competitive with him. And I don't understand, you know, well, she finds out he has a daughter and he's trying to rescue her. I mean, that's that's obviously very heroic, but I never got the feeling like there was a moment where she's like, this guy needs his 007 back. Um, yeah. So he didn't seem I, I to care about it as much. Bond he kind of looked at her I mean, surprised, but um, and yeah. and the the Nomi when she kicks the scientists off the thing, I think they needed a reason for her to do that because if she had just done it, even though M said take him out, I mean that was the order that they had take him out. Um, I think it, she would have seemed as um, not a good guy character, but just like a psychopath. You know, if she just kicked them off, so you needed like one more thing for him to do that sent yeah. her over the top. Came a bit out of left field, I I, I felt, but yeah, yeah, for him too. But, but particularly as he's kind of like a goofy character throughout much of the film, I right. think they felt like they needed to add that in to really make us not like him. But then I also yeah. felt like it was kind of adding. I don't know if it, if it added actually to Safin's ultimate plan or not, because I did come out of the first viewing of the film thinking, so was it like a, a racial thing that Safin was like uh, going for? I'm not sure if that was like his main motivation or if that was just like a Voldo thing, but um, yeah. yeah. I guess Safin oh, just yeah. wanted Voldo, all, that's his all, name. all the Transylvanians to, su to survive. Wasn't he Transylvanian? He sounded like Dracula, I don't know. But <laughs> Calvin, what, are yeah. you, what, how, what was your comment uh, on all of that? Uh, well, I mean, I I think it's uh, it, it's uh, more of a uh, it says more about the media landscape in which we're living in at the moment that we even have the conversation. I suppose like the word woke has just exploded to mean kind of whatever anyone wants. Like if you mm. look it up in the dictionary, it just means to be aware of social injustice. How you know how is a film aware of social injustice? But it's the the word itself has just taken on a different light, um, and. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, nothing makes me roll my eyes more <laughs> than kind of whenever I, you know, see, see a comment like that on a video or whatever, because I think there might be a conversation to be had once the film is released and we can all see it. Um, but when it comes to like, you know, uh, promotional material, I, I just think it's a bit kind of tiring, really. And then particularly when the film actually comes out, and if anything, Nomi's, uh, you know, her arc, if anything, is to sort of learn to be a bit you know, rein it in a bit, uh, drop a bit of the ego, have some respect for this guy. He's got a yeah. lot more years on you. And, and and I think that's really well handled, actually. And I think it's really sweet. I think the moment that seems to be, and I think this is a bit of a testament to some, you know, maybe slapdash writing, but the moment where she kind of turns for him is in when she picks him up in the car in Norway and she realizes, I think she puts two and two together in her mind that, mm. oh, that's your daughter. And I think that she sort of relinquishes the role to him out of respect for that, like, oh shit, you're actually going through an awful lot of stuff with this. Mm. And okay, here is my, um, uh, you know, a, a, a token to you. Um, so no, I, I, I was, you know, I, I thought it was, you know, uh, when you compare it to other things in the series as well, I don't know, yeah. maybe people had similar conversations, but, uh, you know, when Dying the Day came out or, Moonraker, or you know, with Holly Goodhead being quite a uh, quite a feminist character, um, uh, but yeah, I, I think it says more about the media landscape that we're living in right now. Where you know, if you want to, you know, have a YouTube channel where <laughs> every video is woman ruined thing, I like. Then there you go. You, it's it's very monetizable. But yeah, I was going to say it sells a lot of subscribers. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, it certainly does. But uh, yeah, I, I don't think any of us are yeah uh, particularly on that bandwagon yeah. here. But um, no, so. Yeah, it, it was a non-issue for me, I yeah. guess, is where I, I come down on it. Who are you, Joe? Um, I'll straddle the fence a little bit and and say that, uh, you know, I I, I will say that I, I don't like when movies are woke. Doesn't mean that I think a lot of movies are woke. Like, every time somebody shouts the word woke, doesn't necessarily mean I agree with them that it is or it isn't. But I've seen, like, I have seen in cinema, if you saw the last Terminator movie, Dark Fate, was terrible um the last jedi to me is is that's an example of, of where they do sort of they're chasing something and i don't get it um you know it's pretty dismal i think um but with that said i remember the the i, I was about to say months but it's actually years leading up to this film yeah. i remember hearing a lot of people already bellyaching that the film was going to be woke and i'm like guys listen it's not that i 
don't understand the concern. I do, but I'm not seeing any clues in this trailer to make me think that's what's going to happen in this film. So, so I was already kind of like, can we all just shut up already? Like, let's watch the film and, and then we'll we'll discuss it. Um, so that, that's me. That's me trying to play both sides of the the issue. But but with that said. I didn't find anything in this movie that that felt woke to me. I didn't. I honestly didn't f find anybody in this film. Um, I did not at all find the Nomi character to be e even off-putting, much less woke. I, I didn't find her to be um, anything else than than a very interesting, very smart, very capable character. Uh, the fact that there was banter back and forth, a little little playing, a little little needling of each other, her and Bond. I thought. It was frankly wonderful. I thought it was really, yeah. really well done. I mean, again, I, I don't know if you want to see a character that goes 007, you're my hero. I want to be just like you. Uh, okay, does that doesn't seem like good, good writing and good cinema to me. I, I like a little banter back and forth, a little shoving, a little playing. Uh, and yes, I do like the idea that she softened up. I mean, for quite frankly, I felt like Bond always sort of got the upper end of all of those little needling moments. Yes. So, so I, I don't know how anybody would really complain that this is a woke film. I mean, honestly, if I want, if you want to have a conversation about a, a film that actually does do that, no, watch, watch Goldeneye. <laughs> I mean, Goldeneye to me is the one where like, like Bond is always kind of getting sort of um, hoisted on his own petard. Um, yeah, in a fun way, but but that's I mean, but seriously, but this, I didn't find any of that with this one. I, no. I felt like it was all very well done. I mean, I mean, you could probably make an argument if we wanted to that there there are moments that feel like Bond is the only rooster in the hen house. There is a lot of female characters in this film um but again not to its detriment i thought i thought it worked yeah. well I, all the I, I thought all of the female characters are very welcome new characters into the pantheon of, of bond characters so th i will say that uh, joe i agree with you so much that this was probably out of any of the bond films i said to my wife after even the first viewing as strange as it's going to sound, I sound like I felt like the characters were almost gender neutral. Like Madeline has some amazing badass moments that you yeah. would almost expect Bond to have, like in the four scenes with the gun yeah. and everything like that. When she's a child, I mean, everybody roots, everybody roots for when the kid unloads the clip into Safin. Yeah. Um, but I don't think they're like hit over the head like Marvel's done where they show all the women superheroes walking towards the screen right. in slow motion. It's like, I hope yeah. you're all catching how important <laughs> this is and how on target we are. Yeah. Like they didn't do that. They didn't hit you over the head. So I never thought of, I mean, maybe I'm just getting better in my old age, but I never thought of Nomi as, you know, the black woman character agent or anything like mm. that. I just thought here's a great character or here's a well-rounded character. And I thought the characters were written so well Maybe not always the plot, but the characters themselves, I thought, were so good and rich and likable and not likable at times. And it just took you through all that, that I didn't think about it in terms of men and women. Um, I do think the chemistry between Bond and Madeline was better this time than Spectre. But to me, it was never about a man and a woman. It just wasn't. It was about mm. relationships. So to yeah. me, yeah, it just like gender kind of went away in this movie. Well, it, it's it's. I mean, it, I think it does a great job of sort of. You go from the the romantic couple that that they're together because they like each other and they're having a romance, but once the 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 bigger situation emerges, once there's a child in play, we have a, a we are now we have we have a cause a common cause that we will come together i mean it, i kind of feel like it's yeah. it was an interesting commentary on parenting where where once the child comes into the picture it's not about you and i anymore it's it's now we are on the same team and our our job is to raise the child or in this case protect the child so i i think that was yeah very well done and by the way too which, I, which I, by the way is why everybody within the sound of my voice needs to wear a condom <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Again, only yeah. one with kids. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. I, I'll keep. Sorry. I'll, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I had a morning too, so I'll just say that. Uh, but but I, I loved when she did give him back the 007 moniker because I did. I, I felt like it kind of felt felt like it came at the right time of the story because I think they both knew that they were both going into a, a, a situation where not necessarily both of them are going to come out. So I kind of felt like him getting it back before his demise. I was very happy about that because that, that to me felt like like if he if you just go off into the sunset and retire 
we're we're not we're not saving your number for any but for you. Sorry, buddy. We're not. You don't get a plaque on the wall, whatever. But this way, the way it went down, I feel like he does get the plaque on the wall. If that makes sense. Uh, yes, it does. And I, I'm going to say something too. A lot of people who are not Bond fans absolutely love this film without question. I mean, I my my niece, uh, you know, who's a millennial person, just absolutely loved it. But a friend of mine who's my age noticed something that I didn't. He said, as soon as he was given 007 back, he actually knew that he was going to die. And he hadn't heard any of the rumors. He's like, the fact that they're giving this guy this now is mm. kind of a writer's thing of like, this is his best, last baton hurrah. And this guy's going to die. And I'm like, whoa, mm. that's, that's pretty good. But yeah. all right, we're going to do something superfluous. So we've done some heavy stuff. We've done good, that bad palate cleansers. Um, Yurun. It can easily be said that music can make or break a Bond film. And there was a lot of guff beforehand of everybody going like, oh my God, Hans Zimmer, he's the string guy. He's the synth guy. Um, I love Pirates of the Caribbean. I love his work, but not everybody was like that. Hmm. How did you like his work in No Time to Die? How was the music to you? Great. And I'm, I'm actually surprised that uh, a lot of people would be against that. I don't know about uh, Joe and, and Calvin. I was... I wasn't uh, against Hans Zimmer coming aboard. I'm I'm a big Christopher Nolan fan as well. He often pairs with him. Yeah. I think Hans Zimmer almost always does a terrific job, and he did so. I can be very short about this one. He did so here. There were so much great tracks in this. I I do love the callbacks, the Majesties. I I even like, uh, which can't be really. Um, Contributed to Hans Zimmer, but I even like that we get all the time in the world uh, as a callback to, to little fan service like that. Hmm. So you know, the music, no complaints for me that I can think of at all. I can be very short here. I I loved all of it from the gun barrel to the to what we just mentioned. Both of us mentioned it in Cuba. The, the bit uh, where where we, it goes on a rampage. You get the dun 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 dun. No, it's it's amazing this score, and uh, Hans Zimmer can come aboard uh, many times more if you ask me. I like it, Calvin. Yeah, uh, I've been on a journey with this. <laughs> I'm at the point now where I love it. Like I've got the soundtrack, mm. I've listened to it multiple times, and I've really gotten to a point where I love it. I was one of the people who, like, when it was announced that it was going to be Hans Zimmer, and actually, I think we should also um, uh, shout out Steve Mazzaro as well, who. Mm maybe had more to do with the music than uh than hans at the end of the day but uh that that's just the way it goes when you've got hans zimmer do, doing your music i guess um mm. like because it's like a I, I I went in well, as soon as you announce Hans Zimmer, I know what I'm going to get. Whereas previously they had Dan Roma, Dan Roma, uh, mm -hmm. however you pronounce his name, and I'm like, I've never heard anything that this guy's done. I've no yeah. clue what we're going to get there, and that was in a way more exciting. Um, but then when the official podcast started coming out, and you'd hear those little snippets of Zimmer uh, of the the score, I was like, oh god, that sounds so good. That sounds really good. That whole back to MI6 Q where Bond's in the yes. um, the Aston going, <laughs> I, I love it so much. Yeah. It's awesome, isn't it? Um, and then the big Bond. Bum, 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 yeah. which comes in at like, I think about like three or four times during yeah. the film. Yeah, yes, yeah. It comes at the end as well. Yes. Um, yeah. In the stairwell fight at the beginning with the Aston and then I and think Cuba. in the Cuba scene. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, three times. Um, that's all great. I love that. I didn't mind the bits of majesties. At first, the, the music between Bond and M when they're having the conversation by the river, yeah. um, which I'm really annoyed, by the way, because they were filming that scene. That is like literally down the road from where my work is. Like the pub, oh, that, is really? behind, the pub that is behind them is oh, like a pub God. that I've been to many <laughs> a time. made it in there. <laughs> when they were filming that scene, I was off sick. And I only oh, found out like the no. day after. I was so wow. furious when I found that out. Oh. But yeah, that's Hammersmith. That's like where I work. That it's it was a re really odd choice of filming actually. But anyway, um, the On Her Majesty's Secret Service theme comes in during that whole exchange. And at first I was like, why are they doing this? And then it's like, oh, okay, because he's being recruited again. He's once again on Her Majesty's Secret Service. So I guess that's why they're bringing this track back here. The only thing that I really didn't like was the Louis Armstrong song at the very end. And I think it just kind of piles into some of my criticisms about the ending um i really don't like that final scene with Ma uh, matilda and madeline and then having that music there it felt just a bit too uh derivative and kind of nostalgia baity like a lot of franchises these days just sort of want to remind you of things in the past that you liked and bond hasn't 
done that so much up until these last couple of installments where all of a sudden they're kind of bringing back, you know, characters, Blofeld. Um, and, and I felt like that was just a bit of a step too far because that song has its own identity in that other film, in Majesty's mm -hmm. Secret Service. And to give it an alternate identity here, I, I don't feel like that quite worked. Um, but the score on a whole, I really, yeah, love, yeah. but I've really been on a, a journey with it and now I uh, adore it. That's good. Yeah, you've you've evolved with it. I, I, I will say that um, I love the Hans Zimmer parts. I mean, I really liked him. Um, I did get a sneak preview before the movie came out, so I heard them, which it's not great doing that out of context. But the, for example, the final descent, you know, when Bond is walking up the ladder is very moving. I mean, the music works so well with the scene. And even um, I'll Be Right Back, which is when he starts to go gangbusters at the end, uh, has such a great theme to it. And all the ones, I'm still having trouble with the John Barry stuff, even today, especially when M and Bond are talking, like it's almost like a little bit too irreverent, too self-important. Like this is a big conversation about freedom. So we're gonna put this music in here. And um, I think it, it's a little guilty of that. The Vesper notes, the David Arnold Vesper notes are beautiful and well put. I was put. just gonna ask. Yeah, the Arun, to your, to your point of like the best scene. And Arun, you'll get a kick out of this. So Calvin and I had dinner with David Arnold in London. No way. Uh, yeah, we had happen? a dinner. Um, David David Williams and I arranged a dinner, and as a surprise, um, uh, uh, Calvin and, and Peter Brooker were invited. And I didn't quite tell them that this giant, this legend, uh, David Arnold, oh. and literally he sat right across from them. But David was talking to my wife and said he really liked the, the Zimmer music a lot. He, he actually That's goes, great. I really liked Hans's music. You know, they all know each other, I'm sure. Music a lot. He really liked the ode to his piece as well. So you always wonder, like, when someone uses their music, are they like, Arr! but he yeah. actually really liked that part. So it was kind of neat to hear that. Now I feel like going a bit off topic and just asking, like, like <laughs> what was he like and what did you guys ask him? Like, Calvin, what was he like? He's so chilled. He's like mm -hmm. the nicest bloke. And I've heard that from people who've met him yeah. before. At like, even if he just like does a and a or something and people go up to him afterwards, you know, asking for signatures on CDs and stuff, he's like just the nicest bloke yeah. <laughs> imaginable. And he's just happy to chat with everyone. And yeah, we chatted about yeah a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, funnily enough, a lot of things that not, not even Bond really. Yeah, exactly. Cars and things it, like that. It's funny because after Incredible. like on the way home on the tube, I was kind of like, oh damn it, I didn't ask him all these things that I wanted to ask him. Like, uh, yeah, specifically about his Stepford Wives score, which I really like, which I'm sure oh, he doesn't yeah. get many he, questions about. D Danielle, at one point, and Calvin, you can you can attest to this. At one point, she she turns to him and she just found him fascinating, but she didn't understand the gravity of who she was literally sitting next to. But they were sharing food because um, he she's gluten free and he's a vegetarian, so they were sharing a lot of food. Oh. So here's my wife sharing food with David Arnold. And she turns to him, she goes, <laughs> do you mind if I'm asking you questions about your music? And he goes, I love it. I mean, he just, he, th they talked into the night because she, you know, doesn't read making of books like we do. So for him, it was all like kind of new material, but I digress. Yeah, you bring your wife and she gets to talk to him the whole night. Like you, you known David Arnold <laughs> so long and your wife is like, oh, who's this guy? I'm just, yeah, I'm just I, But I kind of did that on purpose because the more she connects with interesting people, the more I could do those type of things. Right. <laughs> uh, so Joe, I know you hated the music. <laughs> See, you see, this it was it was great to leave leave me last because I could be very quick. I honestly, you know, it, it wasn't until maybe even the second time I saw it and I was texting with Warren Ringham, and he said to me, "What did you think of the score?" And I went, "Oh yeah, the score." Like I, I kind of it didn't even register with me. Like I, I remember kind of just being so focused on the story and everything that was, that was happening, and I kind of barely even noticed it. And I remember kind of going into it being kind of kind of worried about Hans Zimmer, but quite frankly, I feel like Thomas Newman did a much better Hans Zimmer than Hans Zimmer did. I felt like this score, it, it was not, you know, I was kind of fearful, Rom, you know, a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Honestly, not at all. And to sort of bring it full circle, I sort of felt like he did such a good job with this film to make it kind of bondish. I, I did sort of have a moment where I kind of went back to, well, why not David Arnold, frankly? Yeah. I kind of feel like Hans Zimmer did a very fine job it was 
very workable. I enjoyed it very like once I started to notice it and, and oh yeah, I, I have the soundtrack. Listen to it. Um, I, I enjoyed it very much. But honestly, I, I feel like it was a very good tribute to James Bond, and it kind of made me go back to the idea like, well, maybe, why, again, why why even tinker with the formula since since uh. Yeah. Is David Arnold literally like all of our like top of list like ticket? I feel like every Bond fan is just like above everyone else. Like he David Arnold it. is just he just yeah, he gets really it. does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I feel like, like to yeah, call he, him he was... the uh... oh sorry sorry no no go ahead Joe you're on. Uh, I'd like to call him the the John Barry of well I'm Calvin's age of our generation kind of yeah, He's, yeah. Uh... I, I completely agree. agree. I, I feel like David Arnold for me. Is it like him and Daniel Kleinman are, are sort of like the, the two perfect examples of yes. where it's so hard to get people who get James Bond, but we were very right. lucky in those two areas to have people who were able to take that mantle and do so well with it because they get it, like you said. And and yeah, except for this time around with Daniel Kleinman. Sorry, uh, <laughs> drop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, controversial. <laughs> uh, well, if we're talking about that, I, I I did feel that the titles were the, the titles at this point. I feel like he I, almost the same criticism I have. Um, uh, oh, I'm gonna lose my Bond card. Who who did the titles before him? Before Kleinman? Bender. Bender. Thank you. I'm sorry. And, and um, no, no, no. MK12. Oh, oh yes, it. yes. So I felt like Solus. Yes, you're yeah. quite right. I felt like in the last days of Binder, I felt like he was just kind of phoning it in. You know, at this point, like he knew is he he knows the routine, he knows what he's what he's doing, and he just kind of can put it on autopilot at this point. I was kind of feeling that from these credits from Kleinman. I feel like he, he knows what he likes. There's a lot of things that we've seen before. Um, it, it's kind of you know little nods to the story with the, with with this image over here we have images of people characters we've seen that before so he, he does kind of have things that he's sort of falling back on at this point yeah and and joe i i i do know um like when i interviewed uh Sidorat, the costume designer she said that she and daniel when they picked out all the costumes they didn't have a script they didn't have a script. They literally had things that said, um, we're going to a warm climate, we're going to a cold climate. So they had to put together clothing with no script whatsoever. He was the same thing. They gave him mm. kind of a general thing. So I felt like this was like the kitchen sink of opening titles. Yeah. We're gonna put a trident, we're gonna put a statue, we're gonna put the shield because there's gotta be London, right? So we're gonna put the yeah. British shield in here. And you know what, um, let's put a bunch of PPKs because he's gonna shoot somebody. Like, mm. you know, it's like, all right. I remember, you know, I'll tell, I'll tell just just a little trivia that I kind of noticed. I, I I remember watching it, thinking there's a very heavy emphasis on the idea that the DB5 is going into water. I remember mm. thinking, like, is it is this supposed to be telling me that after this, James Bond goes and ditches the DB5 to get rid of some evidence or something to that effect, and sort of pitched it into the to the ocean or something? That's cool. Right? People even been been theorizing about that in the gun barrel alone, like because there's no blood and like like the target mm -hmm. this time hits Bond and stuff like like that's been a foreshadowing of mm. the ending. Yeah, people are saying the I gun agree, barrel but... um, is not an enemy; it's his family. Like so, yeah. you know, he doesn't shoot. Yeah, like that's the thing that does him in, because he missed. He didn't right. shoot, and what kills him? Blofeld says it. It's Madeline. Mm. Mm. Which, by the way, you can probably confirm, David, because you've seen the movie on both sides of the world, pretty much. Mm. Like, there's a difference, right, between the European version and the uh, American version, where the American version starts with the MGM logo and it just oh, yes. gets the dots. And we, on our side, get, like, the Universal logo that, that goes into white dots that come mm. in the foreground. Yeah, that's then, true. The tiny ones. Yeah, I, yeah, and somebody I, said also there was um, a couple of versions where um, at the end it said 007 returns instead of James Bond returns. Hmm. Oh, that I think, insinuates I think, uh, difference, you know. But, I, but but not here in the States. It said James Bond will return. With me, it mm. also said James Bond. Yeah, I, I, so maybe that's yeah. just rumor or, you know. Probably. All right, listen. Who, who knows? <laughs> buckle up, everybody. We've been having a very nice chat. Some of us have been drinking. Some of us need to have coffee. Um, <laughs> we're going to do kind of the Academy Awards of No Time to Die, and the four of us are the judges. This is going to be a quick one, though, So, uh, because otherwise this video is going to be longer than the movie. We just can't do that. But I'm going to go around. Um, Calvin, we're going to actually start with you. And it's really talking about who gets this award. 
okay or what okay. gets this award so we're actually going to be talking this is the best character award and let me explain the award so the best character award is the award for the character either you enjoyed the most was fleshed out the most like did you love felix in this movie or did you love this rendition of this character in the movie so out of all the characters that you encounter in this film who calvin dyson are you awarding the best character award to this is actually really tough. Uh, sorry, I know you said this was going to be a quick round, but I just want to say, because you said something earlier on that really clicked with me that I hadn't considered when you said that the characters are all really well-rounded and c come across really nicely. It's the plot that is the, is where the writing yeah. is lacking. And that really resonated with me because I'm like thinking, I actually really do love every character in this. Like, really, yeah. it, 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 even like Primo, like the, the henchman with the eye, like he's really great. Voldo, like all these people, it's full of great characters. Oh gosh. Who That's only one award. Yeah. Uh, uh, is it a cop out to give it to Bond himself, Craig? No. Like, I, I feel like, because he is like, he's, yeah, he's doing something really different here, but I really liked it. Um, I, I, I actually quite like that he is quite chatty in this one, um, after being quite monosyllabic in uh, some of his previous ones. You do get a lot of him. He does feel more rounded, actually, than in the previous ones. Um, so, okay, giving it to Craig, though I feel like that it. might be a bit of a cop-out. No, it's fine. Joe, who are you giving the best character award to? Uh, I'll tell you what, I, I think um, kind of, weird as this might be i think i might give it to felix lighter because i sort of feel like um it was interesting i remember when i saw this and they were kind of you know i remember thinking like in some ways they were kind of pulling a license to kill and one of my criticisms for that one is always that all of a sudden um david hedison shows up and now him and bond are lifelong bffs that he would be his best man i remember thinking like yeah it's kind of a stretch like i remember <laughs> in this one kind of feeling like um they were overplaying their relationship slightly, so mm. a little bit, but still better done. I, I kind of like the the sort of pl the little back and forth they have, um, the little scene where they're playing the game with the coins, and I was like, okay, all right, don't know what that is, but it was working for me. Um, I loved the dialogue between them. I thought it worked yeah. really well. Um, and I, even as he as he's walking out, he says, "Well, at least take my number." He goes, "I've got your number, or whatever." Or something, you know. It was, and it was sort of like double meaning as he said it. And I thought, boy, that's really well written. I really like that. So when when he comes back later and there's the scene on the boat, I was really buying it. And honestly, yeah. um, and 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 the death scene of Felix Leiter, and I I said it in my review. I said it kind of reminded me why it bothered me so much in Quantum, the way they got rid of Mathis. I said I felt I felt like this was the polar opposite, where. The, the, he gets a good death scene. Bond is moved by what's happening. You know, it 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 fit into the story. You yeah. know, and, and now we have added stakes, and 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 frankly, he got a good send off. So, uh, I, yeah, I thought he was handled really nicely in this film. He I was. A, it was so nice to see him back again after not being in in the last two. So, I'll give it to our buddy Felix. I love it. Original choice. Yeroon. Yeah. No. For me, um, hands down, Paloma actually uh, and not just because uh, and I know you've interviewed her recently I can't wait to, mm -hmm. to see uh, that one as well David but you know I, I've seen this movie she was in beforehand War Dogs where, where she is like a supporting character and I joked kind of to friends like there's this one shot in the movie where you see her a close-up of her and you see her her eyes pop out it's like the brown greenish eyes she has and I told my friend, like, she would be a really good Bond girl if she ages a bit more. She, she'd be, yeah, no, she looks good. But then she really delivered as well. And I feel like she was one of the most fun, engaging, quick characters to appear in this movie. And she, she brought, like you just said, it was like a commercial, but she brought so much of this is a Bond movie in there. Yeah. And I know you like that moment where... Nomi uh, comes down with the uh, with the rope and stuff. I was like, oh, I'm just watching. Get out of here, Lashan. I'm watching. Uh, I'm watching Paloma now. That's that's what I kind of had. Like, I want the Paloma so, movie. Damn it! I was so engaged by her, uh, and and it's it's so she was like inexperienced but not incapable. Like when you see mm, her yeah. with the machine gun, uh, when she's chucking the drink, it's funny. Like the, the 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 vodka martini is too strong for her. Yet see, there there is the moment where. Bond thinks uh, they're going to do something, but he just wants to get the tuxedo on and stuff. It's 
very fresh. And uh, yeah. when she says goodbye to him and gives the cigar for Felix and stuff, it's like, ah, that was it. We knew beforehand we were only going to get something like that out of her because we've only seen her in the dress. We know this was going to be it. Yeah. But boy, did she deliver. Mm. She, did. she did. By the way, I I, just, just to sort of throw back to the earlier conversation about things being woke, I remember one of the criticisms I've heard is that there, there's really not a lot of sex in this movie at all. I mean, right. there's, there's in the opening scene, there's a scene where that's it. Bond and Madeline are in her bed, and that's really it. I, I, I liked how when the scene with Paloma ended, the, the, just the, the tiniest little comment of like, stay longer next time. I will. It was almost like just the, the tiniest of winks, you know, oh, to the yeah, audience, yeah. saying yeah. like, you're like, in a, in a different circumstance, this might have been where that would have happened. We yeah. got you yeah, a little wink, and that's it. And I, I thought that was perfectly done. You know, but you could argue, Joe, that um, although there wasn't a lot of sexual stuff in this film, it's the most effective sex that James Bond ever had, that one in Matera. Because <laughs> it, yeah. it netted Matilde mm -hmm. and, and Doodoo. Um, I'm going to give, just for the just for the sake of variety, uh, I'm going to give um, my character, best character award, to a character that every scene that he was in, I loved without question. And I thought it was so well done. And the the his interaction with the other characters in the film elevated their roles. And that is Q, Ben Winshaw. Yeah, he was also I great. thought yeah. he was phenomenal. He wasn't over the top. He was caring. He wasn't bombastic. He was Q. And most importantly, he's one of the most consistent Q characters through all films, from Skyfall to Spectre to No Time to Die, he didn't change the way he was Q. You know, mm. you didn't get these other things coming through. And I just, I thought he was great. I love the whole apartment scene. It'll go down as one of my favorite Q scenes out of the 25 series. Um, I, I loved it all, just everything, the cat, the humor, just, it, it was perfect. So, all right, here we go, here we go, here we go. And Calvin, you are going first. <clears throat> um, this is going to be after my own heart. You know, you're on my channel. We have to do this. It is the best style award. Now, what I mean by that is not necessarily clothing. It could just be the best style environment. It could be the best style moment for Bond or some other character. It could be the best outfit that you liked, of course. Um, and it doesn't have to be the fanciest. So, for example, Joe loved Jamaica. So maybe that was his favorite style moment. It could be the surroundings. But that's what the style award should be about. Kyle, uh, Kyle, listen to me. Calvin, who, who are you giving? <laughs> too much to drink. Uh, who are you giving the style award to? Or what? Uh, I, you know, uh, maybe this will tell you something about my own personal taste, but uh, Q's apartment. <laughs> mm. I was just, oh, I could really live here. This is like very <laughs> much my style. I'm not a cat person. I'm a dog person. But that aside, um, yeah, when that comes out on Blu-ray, <laughs> that that is, as Joe said earlier on about, you know, potentially changing the decor to uh, match a certain thing. I'm going to be looking at that Q scene like, hmm, interesting. Even his like cooking implements and stuff. I'm kind I was going to say, how do you not have that Japanese apron? <laughs> I, yeah, no, I, I know. I, re I really do need that. And I want to, I still want to find that music that he's playing <laughs> when everyone arrives. He's playing this like ping pong -y kind of sounding. <laughs> bloop, really. bloop, 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 bloop. Yeah, yeah, that's you it. The, yeah. You know you can get the bamboo steamer. At least that's that was an, that's an easy one you can get. Yes, yes. So I think, um, yeah, that's but I, I've always... Choice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Ben was short. I liked even, even like, you know, his clothes. He's eating gummy worms at some point, which is a snack that I really yeah. like. So, uh, you know, yeah. he does remind me of you. Uh, oh, God. So sometimes. <laughs> People have way, said a that. Very good way. Yeah. I have my blue light glasses here so I can try <laughs> oh, putting them right. on. And whoa, it's Ben Wishel's joined the. Joined yeah. the <laughs> if I blink. Yeah. <laughs> That's perfect. I love that one. All right, Yarun, I'm gonna choose you next. Uh, who Ooh. best style award person thing environment? Yeah, this is a tough one. Oh man, um, I think a lot of the a lot of in terms of doing things in a stylish Bondian way was again in the pre-title sequence, and even though it was teased for the most part the donut that bond does in the db5 you know mm. he's about to give up but as soon as those guns come out you see primo go oh shit now i better get out of here. That, that to me is like uh, here he comes and he's it's building up yeah it's not necessarily stylish because the whole thing gets shot to pieces <laughs> but um it's bond that's a that's such a a fresh way because the db5 we've seen it so many times 
Yeah, I did notice it had a different license plate this time around, though. But I don't know if you guys. I would hope so. The other license plate would. <laughs> it's always BMT two sixteen A. Always, except in, in the Brosnan movies. But right. now it's I don't know. I, I didn't. But different. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I I think maybe I give it more thought and something else pops to mind. But okay, that, we, that we can come back to a stylish yeah. one. Yeah. Joe, what about you? Do you do you like his uh, Jamaica outfit or? Uh, I, I do, but before I, I actually, you reminded me of something that I really liked. Um, oh. That scene in the DB5 when they've just been hit and there's and the, and they're all just shooting at them and Bond oh, have, it, has having a moment where he's just sitting there, right? And they're hitting. On subsequent viewings, when I watch that scene and I I see Madeline, she's a like kind of just a blubbery what? mess. Yes, Boogie, boogies and everything. Yes. Yeah, I mean she's. When you watch it the second, third time or whatever, you, you start to realize, oh, it's not for her life that she's upset for. That's right. Once you 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 understand she's holding she's her stomach. That's yes. And yes. and again, once you and, and that's oh, one of yeah. one of the, the she holds her stomach the, twice. She holds it in the DB5, yeah. she holds her hand against the thing, and then she holds her stomach like this, and then she does it when she gets on the train. Yeah. She does the same thing. She holds the side and then holds her stomach. That really, honestly, oh, on wow, subsequent viewers, brilliant. that really sort of jumped out at me. And, I, oh. and, it, and it, yes, exactly. Um, back to your question, though. I, <laughs> I think my answer is probably going to be pretty obvious. I will say it's the, the, the whole Jamaica thing, the Jamaica house, honestly, just it really did. I mean, even just little subtle things like him when he would walk in and out, hit the little little buttons to hide little things here and there. And you see the things in the drawers, the little details of the books on the table. I mean, all that was getting me. Um, but I'll add to that and say, honestly, I just just loved the idea of Bond on a boat. Like I just felt like oh, Bond yes. in retirement on a boat. And I felt like that is so I mean, and not only honestly, I will say this. Like there's the, the shot is basically M saying where's 007 and they cut to James Bond, which was interesting because a lot of people speculated they were, you know in the trailers he was going to cut to Nomi, but the fact that they cut to James Bond, he's just chilling out on the boat and when he gets off the boat, and he's and like I said I, I think I said this earlier he's got he's got two fish in one hand he's got the spear gun in the other hand and plus he's wearing like the, that that gray T-shirt that that we see yeah. you know all the way back to casino I remember honestly feeling like that was sort of like the perfect amalgam of daniel craig's bond and fleming's bond yeah all sort of put together in in one single solitary moment him walking down the down the down the, the pier with with that in his hand i mean i like you you just couldn't get better yeah. than that so I I, I I i have to hand it to that i i honestly it's that whole the house the thing and, and by the way i'll even throw in the shower to the outdoor shower yeah like and the I, wood I toothbrush like, the wood toothbrush like they like, get the I, dna I, from did you sort of feel like showering indoors now feels like a total cop out? I so want to shower Joe. outdoors every single time. <laughs> and you now. did it, David, right? I was you just going to say at the Lagoon Villa that I stayed yeah. at, it was an only an outdoor shower. Oh, amazing. So yeah, if I you wanted to that. shower, you had to go and you're literally under under a canopy of stars and trees and frogs. And oh it was God. amazing. Uh, to the point where Danielle, I think at one point said, we need one of these at home. But yeah, it's, <laughs> it's addictive. The neighbors By the are going to love it, but... Uh, <laughs> but yeah, my my style choice because I'm gonna totally cheat here because of course I am, um, is the back to the Cuba scene when he's wearing that outfit, you know, the Tommy Bahama shirt. He's got the you know the 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 boat coat on from Barber, and she whips out the suitor, and in there is the tuxedo, and you see yeah. him for the first time in a tuxedo, and you hear that Bond music play, and sure enough, he adjusts his cuff. Mm -hmm. He does the little like shooting yeah. of the cuff. To me, that's just it. Just it is Bond. So that whole transition, you know, from retired life to being Bond, um, to me, that was just everything. All right, gentlemen, believe it or not, we have been talking for nearly two hours. I think we've taken a very different approach. We haven't gone scene by scene. We've left a lot of things on the table. That's how much there is to talk. But I'm going to give each of you a chance, uh, a, a moment, if you will, to say whatever you want to this audience that we're looking at right now about the Bond film. It could be No Time to Die, of course. It could be about how you feel about it now, um, what your thoughts are, have they grown over time. This is your opportunity for me to rip up my questions <laughs> and for you to talk about what you want to talk about. 
So I'm going to actually ask for a volunteer of who wants to go first. Don't everybody Nobody raise your first. hand at once. <laughs> I can go. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I, ooh, to say anything about this film, um, I, ooh, if, if there was one thing at the top of my list to tell people about this film, see it more than once. I don't think any of the Bond film has okay. ever required that more than anything else. Like, I was shell shocked. Well, David, we experienced this together. We saw it together yeah. for the first time. So it was like this, you know, we, we had to sort of leave the Albert Hall sort of shell shocked stagger to the hotel bar to just have a decompression kind of drink because the ending is so strong and it's going to hit any huge Bond fan um, like a ton of bricks. And I think you need to take that breath afterwards, no matter how your reaction is to that, and then go back, see it again, knowing how it's going to end, knowing what happens, and then uh, I, I, it certainly helped me. I had a much clearer uh, thought process of how I felt about it. That actually, no, I do really love, like, earlier on when you said about the excellent uh, poor scale, um, for about two hours, this is in excellent territory for me, mm. honestly, but then the very last, like, half hour, whatever it is, is in incredibly poor territory. So it is this, uh, and I'm looking forward to the conversations that we're going to be having in the years to come over this film, because I think it's going to be one that um, is going to be good to look back on. Um, even when a new Bond comes, I think it's going to be interesting to look back on this and the whole Craig era as a, right. as a single arc. Um, I think we're going to be talking about it for a long time. Uh, yeah. A Bond film has not stayed with me like this after the yeah. initial viewing for so long or initial viewings. Like I was thinking about it for weeks to the point that I felt kind of exhausted by it. Um, so, so, so yeah, I think it's a very rich film. I think there's an awful lot of um, meat to get your teeth into, but I think it demands multiple viewings. Um, yeah, and it's certainly essential viewing. It's definitely not one that you can skip. I agree. Well said. You're ruined. Yeah, no, well said indeed. I don't know how much I can add to that um, because I'm, I completely agree with Calvin here. I, I just like to say, you know, we're in dire times it's we're in a pandemic we've been waiting for so long for this movie and this is what it is so i just like to say to the viewers like enjoy it we finally have a bond movie again it's been way too long for my liking for all of our likings i think and i hope to wait for the next one wherever that is going to be isn't going to be another decade or so i hope we'll get something very soon like hopefully maybe on the 60 year anniversary in which i know david has more information on i hope they announce something uh, uh something more like is it maybe maybe hints of the next actor of hints of the next direction they're going in or something but overall um uh, I, I just like to say to people enjoy we we finally bond is back and we have him back and it's yeah. well deserved for all of us i think i love that what a great sentiment joe um, so I will, I will echo what, what everybody has said already about that. I, I think multiple viewings is definitely required for this one. Um, I'll go so far and, and it's, I, and I also agree wholeheartedly that I, I almost sort of wish I could look into the future to myself a year from now and, and, and see like, if we all come back like a year from now and say, okay, you've had a year to, to, to sit with it. You've, you've got it on Blu-ray. You've seen it a bunch of times. How does it feel now? Uh, I'm very curious to see how this ages. Uh, if I had to guess, and I, I might eat my words when that time comes, I kind of do feel that we are having sort of an Honor Majesty Secret Service moment where, uh, you know, when that film came out, obviously it was not Connery, it was not the fun ending, it was not whatever. Over time, we've, we've sort of, a lot of us have, have gone back and called it a masterpiece. It's it's one of the best. It's fantastic. I, I kind of feel like we're, good, we're sort of going through that with this, where it is it is going to take us a lot of time to, to sit with it, to let it be. But I do have to wholeheartedly agree that uh, I, I think this film is a spectacular film. I, I feel like, you know, whereas for so many years specter was the last film we saw and it just did not get any better the more we sat with it it was yeah. kind of almost uh, it was very the, the, the longer it sort of lingered as our most recent bond the more it kind of stung a little bit like mm, it's not very good i feel like this one i i feel like it's just gonna keep improving with every viewing um i i feel like from my personal point of view i could almost like my 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 subconscious bond checklist, all those things that I, I crave and really enjoy 
all of them are in this film in spades just like from just seeing bond in in down moments and and i felt like seeing him in in the opening scene um with madeline shows me down downtime bond in a relationship then i get downtime downtime bond in no relationship just how he would chill out on his own for me that really resonated i loved all that the 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 locations were were spectacular the cinematography is spectacular i thought the the dialogue was very good um maybe not quite casino royale and skyfall level but still pretty good um so yeah all of the things that i'm really looking for are in this and i do go back to to so we, we kind of predicted earlier that that the, the craig tenure might be this kind of w-shaped thing where strong little weaker strong little weaker strong and i feel like if you do watch this as sort of a 10 hour you know just just sat there and did a marathon of all of them i i, I definitely feel like the whole craig series does now sort of work very well in that and um yeah i feel like it, it kind of ends the way it needs to so that's yeah the best i got no, that's amazing. And, you know, it's interesting. There's commonality, Calvin, Joe, you own what you're all saying in the sense that the repeat viewings, I will say that in my first and second and third and fourth, it does get better. And I'm seeing it again tomorrow, a fifth time. And I have a feeling I'm going to like it even more. So I think, um, sorry if I'm going to offend anybody, I think this is a grower, not a shower of a Bond film. <laughs> Sorry if you know those terms, I apologize. <laughs> but more importantly, I think what Jeroen said is so vital, and it dovetails into what you both said too, Calvin and Joe, is that this has got to be a celebratory moment for you. If you don't feel the ending is celebratory, we have a Bond movie that literally I could walk out, get in my car, and go to a theater. Pretty soon we won't. Like I'm already upset because I notice it's left 4D, it's left uh, Dolby, you know, now it's only in 2D in a lot of areas. And I'm like scrambling to see it in IMAX before mm. it leaves IMAX. Like it's fleeting. This thing that we're doing right now is fleeting. And soon, before you know it, we won't have a Bond film in theaters that everybody's talking about. We'll be talking about as, oh, the last Bond film that came out. So, you know, I'm, I'm reminded in my last statement here, uh, it sounds like a debate, sorry, Calvin, um, is what Dryden said, you know, made you feel it, did he? I don't like this ending because it made me feel something very strongly about their choices. And, you know, I think that over time, when I become okay, and I go through the, uh, is it nine phases of death and denial and all this stuff, that I'll probably start to be okay with it and better. And therefore, the film may move from good to great. I don't know if it'll be excellent because again, my character was, I don't know if you noticed, incinerated, but um, it did make me feel, and that's a pretty powerful thing because there's not a lot of Bond films like The Man with the Golden Gun. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Love it. We'll watch it twice today. But it doesn't make <laughs> me feel anything. You know, it's, it just makes me feel giddy and happiness and, you know, this is delicious pizza. But this is a powerful film. I don't think anybody could argue that. And the fact that we can have a round table for two hours and somebody out there is still watching this after two hours <laughs> means it's a powerful film that's creating powerful conversations. So I am going to absolutely thank Calvin, Joe, and Yarun for coming on. But before I let you go, there is a promise I made my audience, and I apologize. But there is a promise I made. And head of section, we're going to start with you. Um, I did say that I was going to make you all rank right. the Daniel Craig yes. films in order of your favorite to your least favorite. Joe, we're going to ask you to go first. <laughs> um, this is interesting because I, I, I just luckily got a little uh, sneak peek at uh, Calvin's ranking. So I sort of know where he is. Ah. And I thought it was fascinating because I I, I was like, wow, as similar as, as they are, not not one of ours uh matched up so i thought that was sort of clever um i i will okay so i'll specter is at the bottom quantum is above that skyfall is third no time to die a second and casino is number one and uh good. and like i said i i feel like I, i'm repeating myself but no one is surprised is as surprised as I am by that. I I, I do I do feel like I, 
normally I'd be a lot of the criticisms that people have of this. I feel like normally I'd, I'd be right there with you, but somehow I feel like it was pulled off just so, so spectacularly well um, as, as well as it could have been put it that way. So yeah. there you go. All right. Love it. Dutch bond fan. You're up next. By the way, I'm saying uh, your official channel names because fine. people are going to remember these rankings. Trust <laughs> me. <laughs> Now, mine, uh, mine is a little different. I think our top choice will probably be obvious, but, but the rest is different. Uh, for me, Quantum is, is at the bottom. Uh, I know this, this is not your liking, David, but uh, no, I'm still not a fan of, of Quantum at all, but I won't get into it here. Uh, Spectre, I liked a lot more than I think Calvin and Joe and, and maybe you do as well. Um, but that goes above quantum for me. Then no time to die, right in the middle, which I was kind of expecting it to go, and yeah, yeah then it did. And Skyfall and and then Casino Royale are the top ones for me. Casino Royale is is to me the the near perfect Bond movie, uh, quintessential one. The, yeah, that's um, you can't beat that yet. Hopefully one day they did do, but for me yeah. uh, that's mine. Yeah. And it even has a death of an important character at the end, but we're okay with it. Yeah. Go figure. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Calvin Dyson. <laughs> well, sorry, David, <laughs> but uh, Quantum Solace is at the bottom of my What the list. F is going on here? I'm, I'm sorry. I know we did that whole debate video, and I was like, you're winning me over, you're winning me over, and then I rewatched it. I was like, oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so so that and Spectre, uh, uh, yeah, at, at the bottom. Um, yeah. And then it's a big leap up to No Time to Die in the middle. Um, and then a bigger leap up further to I'm gonna put Casino Royale two and Skyfall number one. And I know this is like a totally personal thing. Oh, no. I if I'm like stepping outside myself, looking objectively, um, I think Casino Royale is a better film. But Skyfall is just a film that I can stick on whenever I've seen. It's the Craig film I watch the most. It is one of those just like I can yeah. just put this on and chill. I love everything um, about yeah, it. Skyfall's great. Yeah, it, it really is. It's um, but but I I think Casino Royale is a better sort of film. You know, if you were going to give the Oscar to one of them, it would be right. Casino Royale. But um, yeah, Skyfall, I just yeah, absolutely yeah. adore. And th this is not going to surprise anybody, but so uh, Spectre starts off at the bottom. Um, Quantum, yeah. Quantum. Yeah, yeah, we're with you. I thought uh, you were like quantum number gotta, one fan. This is gotta be somewhere. I, I mean, it's, I'm, a, I'm a huge. People don't understand. I'm a huge fan of quantum, but I, I'm. I understand where it falls in the ranking. I'm a huge defender. Absolutely, <laughs> but um, I would put No Time to Die next, squarely in the middle. I would put Skyfall next. Now, by the way, I had put Skyfall and No Time to Die neck and neck until. Literally on my trip from uh, uh, going to Jamaica, they had Skyfall playing on the entertainment. Yeah. And I watched Skyfall. And mind you, I'd just seen No Time to Die about a week ago. And Skyfall's fantastic. It just is. And it's just fantastic. So um, Skyfall and then, of course, Casino Royale. Because I think Casino Royale is still, for me, probably the best Bond film out of them all. It just delivers everything, just checks it off. Mm. So... Gentlemen, that's it. We're going to close this roundtable for now. I am going to do this, though. I'm sure we'll be talking more as a group uh, throughout. Uh, look, we got a 60th anniversary coming, even after the movie leaves us next year. I'd love to get this group back together. I mean, you know, this is kind of the, the YouTube foursome. So, um, and who knows? You know, maybe I'll put in my calendar, Joe, for October 23rd, 2022, for the four of us to come back. And let's find out how we feel about No Time to Die. Maybe it's maybe it's 24 on Joe's ranking now. That, that, <laughs> that, who knows? I will be very curious to see how, how that... It, it'll hold up place. well. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you for everything. Appreciate it. Thank you and very much. My pleasure. And this has been David Zaritsky for The Bond Experience. We'll see you all real soon. Take care, everyone. Thanks, buddy. See ya. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from the Bond experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.